Alrighty, I'm going to start the meeting here. The meeting is now in order. The California Coastal Advisory Committee on January 14th. And I'm calling the meeting to order. And Cynthia, do you have your little flag with you? Uh, no, but we have a flag that's uh, on the screen. Where? Oh, okay, great. I would like, uh, Joe, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I sure will. If folks Thank can you. stand if they're able where they're at. Oh, I'm going to stand right. up. Ready, begin. Uh, pledge, pledge of allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Perfect. <laughs> oh, good. That's a, done. that's a great way to start. Thank you very much, Joe. Let's move on to roll call, please, Cynthia. Sure. Uh, Gary McCacken. Gary's absent. Here. Here. Oh, we've got a voice. Gary, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Welcome. Joe Zidron. Present. Uh, Chris Kaczynski. Here. Charlie Smith. Here. Doreen Campo Piano. Here. Susan Ambrose, Chair Ambrose. Here. All right. All righty. All righty, let's go on to approval of minutes. This shouldn't take us too long. <clears throat> Anybody have any comments on November? Susan, did you want to move Chris up above minutes or you want to move forward oh, with the minutes? Move? Um, well, Chris, are you in a hurry this evening? Ma Madam Chair, I, I go at the wish of the chair. I have no problem with waiting for you to take care of your business. It's okay. Thank you, though, uh, for asking. Well, what, what is the, what's the pleasure of the committee? We can either move our speaker, Mr. Webb, who's kind enough to be with us tonight up right now and do our minutes after our presentation. Maybe that would be easier for everybody. Yeah, I, I support that. I think that makes sense for everybody's time. I think so too. Let's go ahead and do that. So um, Cynthia, could you please give us a little description of our guest speaker and all of his wonderful things that he's bringing to us? Would you indulge us please, Chris Webb, with Cynthia giving us the short dessert version? All right. Chris Webb is Supervisory Coastal Scientist at Moffat & Nickel in Long Beach, California, where he's been with the company for 28 years. Mr. Webb manages beach and wetland restoration projects in Southern California. He worked on both of the San Diego Regional Beach Sand Projects and has experience working with large groups to nourish shorelines. Oh, great. So I am going to work on sharing my screen. So, um, are you running the, the video or the slides? Yeah, I'm going to run the slides. Okay. And let's see if we can get that. Um, can you folks see it? Yes, I can. Yeah. Well done. Is everybody able to see this slide? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Perfect. Let us move along. Mr. Webb, welcome to our committee tonight. We're delighted to have you. The floor well, is yours. Absolute, it's an absolute pleasure, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so what this is, is kind of an information piece, as has been indicated, about the um, movement that seems to be occurring down in South Orange County to potentially consider forming a larger group uh, of agencies to band together to find sand and put it on the beaches. Um, so I'm just trying to give you a little bit of background and maybe some pros and cons about that and ask for your consideration to move it forward um, and potentially be willing to participate in a coalition if it gets legs and starts um, becoming a reality. So go ahead and advance the slide, uh, Ms. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> it's okay. So I, I think um, a lot of you are familiar with the condition of the coastline in your town. And this photograph was provided to us by a gentleman who lives down at the south end of town. There's 
there have been um, some communications made to us by some folks in San Clemente and then some folks in neighboring jurisdictions like Dana Point, Capistrano Shores, uh, San Onofre, and the south end of San Clemente, Cottons Point and the other homeowners groups are um, included in that. <clears throat> and so what people are grappling with is a loss of beach and a concern about the future. And this is just a photograph that shows uh, last year that the train went by. And when the train goes by, I guess it's got to time the sets or something to try to stay dry. And it didn't work on this particular pass. It got wet. So this is a, a recent picture. And if you advance to the next slide, um, you can see what it was like, at least at this moment in time, six years ago. <clears throat> and this was before a hurricane swell hit the coast called Hurricane Marie in August of 2014. And that decimated a lot of beaches. And I was told the south end of the town lost a lot of sand during that hurricane swell. And so, you know, there's problems associated with that. And the, that part of the beach hasn't recovered. Go ahead and advance the slide, Cynthia. And I think you folks know a lot about the rest of the town, obviously, right? You're the Coastal Advisory Committee and you live there. And this is North Beach and the snack bar. Last year or year before last, 2019, this is taken from your local journal, the San Clemente Journal, where they show the undermining of the foundation. And if you advance the next slide, about almost 20 years ago, maybe 18, 19 years ago, that beach was wider and the snack bar had fewer issues, at least at that point in time, it appears, and seem to be doing okay. So there are problems on both ends of town. And then if you look in the middle, go to the next slide, you know, the lifeguard Marine Safety Headquarters building has always had issues with undermining and it's sitting on piles and it's, there's a plan to potentially consider relocating it and that's um, in place or being prepared right now. So, you know, there, there are issues with sand and the narrowing of the beaches in San Clemente. Well, this is also happening in your neighboring areas. Um, San Onofre State Beach is having problems with erosion. Um, as I indicated, beaches to the north, such as Capistrano Shores, are having dreadful problems with erosion, and the County of Orange is struggling with that, and Dana Point's also um, having issues in their city, and so is Doheny State Beach. So California State Parks is grappling with the whole thing, and the railroads having problems with it. So all these groups are starting to talk. And the County of Orange has started to actually consider leading the preparation of a coalition of these agencies to band together to try to do regional beach replenishment, which means bringing sand in and placing it at a lot of different beaches within all these jurisdictions and having a large scale project occur in South Orange County, which could start the process of fixing the problem. So why don't you go ahead to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm privileged to have experience with San Clemente because we were able to participate in the Opportunistic Beachville program, which was established in 2005 and reestablished, I think, in 2012. And we helped two projects to occur at North Beach. That project was identified as being necessary for the city or attractive to the city because the city had problems with erosion back in the early 2000s, too, ever since I've been coming there that it's been narrow it's seasonally variable but you know the need is really to try to offset the problem of having a beach that's too narrow and all the problems that come along with that such as there's threats to some coastal infrastructure from that such as the uh, marine safety headquarters building restrooms the railroad there's a reduction in benefits that come to the city from having narrow beaches the wider the beach the more people show up and the more people spend money in the city the narrower the beach, the opposite happens. There's actually um, habitat that's being considered as more sensitive now than ever that's associated with sandy beach habitat. Um, that's lost if the sand goes away. It's gained if there's sand replenished. And then sea level rise is projected to occur in the future. And, you know, that would only make the existing condition worse because there'd be higher water levels and less sand to um, buffer backshore areas from the ocean. So, you know, if there can be a plan that's put together that's acceptable to the agencies that regulate these things, the permit agencies and the resource agencies, that would be a hit, potentially. So if you'd advance to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. What happened to the beach? Well, I think there's a lot of conjecture about what's happened to the beach, but over time, the natural sand supplies that came from up coast, such as sand out of the mouth of San Juan Creek, 
that hit the shoreline just really doesn't come down down coast anymore. There is very little nourishment that's occurred. There was some that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s, but that is no more. There's been very little that's occurred since then. So the amount of nourishment is almost zero. So there's a gradual narrowing of the beach over time. And then if a significant storm swell hits, such as Hurricane Marie swell in 2014, the beach gets narrow and doesn't seem to recover, which leaves you with a, a beach like today, which is really small. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. So <clears throat> we know the city has pursued an Army Corps of Engineers project and is in the process of that um, becoming a reality in the future. That's good. Pardon me. That's okay. You know, the, the way to really create a beach is simply to add sand to it and to add sand to beaches on either side of it. The beach is a temporary storage place for sand as it moves along the coast. Waves tend to carry it from north to south in the wintertime, and they turn around and head from south to north in the summertime. So the sand will be, will, will reach a beach and then just slowly migrate down the coast. And as it moves down the coast, it tends to slow down in some places and start to collect to become a beach. And then it speeds up in other places and tends to just pass through and, and not sit at, at other beaches and leave the beaches kind of barren. <clears throat> the size of a beach is really related to the volume or the three-dimensional volume of sand that's there. The larger the volume of sand that's there, the bigger the beach, of course, the, the wider it is and the higher it is, and the smaller the volume of sand that's there, the smaller the beach. Go ahead and advance the next slide. It's similar to like a bank account to where if there is more sand coming into a beach then leaving that beach under the energy of waves then the beach will start to um, grow in a creek and the beach will get wider if there's less sand coming into a beach than is being lost from that beach by the um, energy of waves then the beaches will gradually become smaller and narrower and lower and therefore they shrink <clears throat> if the same amount of sand comes into a beach then leaves the beach then it's it's in an equilibrium and the beach remains relatively the same in size. The goal here would be to bombard the beaches with sand to increase the volume of, of sand at that beach far more than is removed from that beach by wave energy. And that can happen. It successfully happened in other locations. So that's what a regional nourishment program would accomplish. Go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. So the city, like we indicated, has, has done a lot of work to solve the problem already. They've um, gotten themselves into a process with the federal government to have the Corps of Engineers come and do a project as soon as possible. Terrific. That would be wonderful. They've also worked since the early 2000s, like I indicated already, <clears throat> to bring in sand from other locations called opportunistic sand. The idea is that it's relatively cheap. It comes from a construction source, maybe a river nearby or far away or a harbor or a contractor that's digging out a hotel, you know, parking garage underground or whatever, that's suitable sand, it would be placed on the beach. And the city's done a couple of projects. What the city hasn't had an opportunity to really do yet, and now is being discussed, is to actually join, band together with other cities and with the county and other interested groups like the railroad and some sanitation districts um, to form a coalition to do it as a group. <clears throat> and there's power in numbers, and there's better effect if it's done as a group. So that would be the next step, and that's what I'm bringing to you tonight for your consideration and um, for your decision-making in the future. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So beach nourishment can succeed. There are a lot of folks that will indicate, well, no nourishment isn't a permanent thing and it won't succeed, and that's not true. However, in order to succeed, there's got to be enough sand placed on the beach for it to stay and remain um, in place longer than would otherwise occur. The, the larger the volume, the longer it stays, typically. And then it has to be repeated or renourished. It's not a one-time thing. It's more like every 10 years would be good. An example of that, I've, I've listed five projects here. The first two are examples of that kind of work. And the first one is in North Orange County at a place called Surfside Colony near Sunset Beach, California. It's at the north end of Huntington Beach. And I'm a, a resident of Huntington Beach. And I've lived there um, since about 1996. 
And Huntington Beach has um, a state beach that's a thousand feet wide. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's a thousand feet wide. And the only reason it's a thousand feet wide is because sand has been placed in North Orange County at Surfside Colony since 1959. So it's gone for how many years is that? It's 61 years because I was born in 1960. I can tell you right now. The math is, I can do the math quick when I was born close to that date. So by sustained nourishment and the federal government, Corps of Engineers did this approximately every 10 years since that time. So they've done six or seven of them. And they're about 2 million cubic yards every time they do it. That sand has moved to the south. So go ahead and advance the slide. And let's look at a couple pictures of it. These are two different pictures of the same site. <clears throat> this is looking from the air, like at Google, using Google Earth or something. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see a beach, which is um, Sunset Beach and Surfside Colony. Surfside Colony is where the arrow is pointing to. It's a fairly high-end, you know, residential location with movie stars that own homes and stuff. Celebrities live there. There was a, a harbor built behind it at Huntington Harbor um, in Anaheim Bay back in the 1940s for World War II. The jetties that were installed to protect the entrance to that harbor cut off the supply of sand to this site. They also caused waves to reflect off the jetty and come back to the beach at, with higher energy. So there's a bite that gets taken out of the beach over time at Surfside Colony and that sand leaves there under wave energy and heads to the south, which is downward in the photograph. And you can see the beach gets a little wider as you look toward the south. Well, the beach to the south is wide enough, but it gets narrow over time. So the Corps of Engineers comes in, and if you look at the photograph on the right, they place sand right in the erosion hole, they call it, to the tune of about 2 million cubic yards. That's about, that's almost 10 times what the Corps of Engineers is going to do in San Clemente. This is a big effort. And, and now this isn't an effort just to nourish Surfside Colony. It's an effort to nourish all of North Orange County from this location of Surfside Colony all the way down to Newport Harbor. And by doing this 2 million cubic yards every 10 years or so, the beaches in Huntington Beach are a thousand feet wide is the widest. The narrowest is probably still 100 to 150 feet wide. And that's where there's a place called Huntington Cliffs, which tends to be kind of eroding. But the, the main part of Huntington Beach and Newport Beach are several hundred feet wide every day, even in the winter, when winter swells hit. So this kind of project succeeds if it's done in a sustained way. Um, another example, if you'll advance the slide, I think you're going to see another couple of pictures of Surfside Colony. The same thing I just talked about is shown in these two aerials. These happen to be color. Um, and you can see them just as good as the prior ones. So this isn't any new information, just a, just a more recent photographs of that same project. There's a plan to do this project again, uh, I believe in 2021, fall of 2021. <clears throat> so we might see it again in about nine months. They do it in September and it runs through January or February. So advance the slide, please. So in San Diego County, there's a model for what we're recommending you consider doing. The model is um, San Diego Association of Governments, otherwise known as SANDAG, that's their acronym, banded together and formed a coalition of all the coastal cities in, in San Diego County and the county. And I think it's eight cities in the county got together and they started this in, in the late 1990s. They started something called their Regional Beach Sand Program. And so they were able to um, put together, cobble together funding amongst themselves and use that as seed money to apply for state money. And they applied for state money from the Department of Boating and Waterways and received a significant amount of money to do a project in the year 2001. That was enough money to place approximately 2 million cubic yards of sand at a, a total of 12 different locations. So it's on the order of 100,000 cubic yards or 200,000 cubic yards at these different individual locations. And there were sand placed in every city that was a member of the coalition. Oceanside, Carlsbad, Encinitas, Solana Beach, Del Mar, San Diego, um, and Imperial Beach. The only one that didn't get it, didn't participate was Del Mar. I'm sorry, Coronado, excuse me. So 
This project created wide sandy beaches that lasted approximately five to six years. Sandeg monitored the beaches after they were built to quantify how long the beaches lasted and were discernible from this project. This is a photograph of one at the north end of Encinitas near Batiquitos Lagoon. It's called Batiquitos Beach and it's right after the beach was built and you can see a wide sandy beach in the foreground and if you look toward the distance which is to the south um, the beach narrows down and becomes almost zero in, in, in north Encinitas or central Encinitas. So it, it shows that Nourishment builds it fast. The beach starts to spread and move to the south over time. So this sand headed south and benefited the area that's down in the down coast area where the beach is very narrow in this photograph in, middle, in the middle of Encinitas. But it also remained to some extent here at the placement site at near Batiquitos Lagoon. So go ahead and advance the slide again, please. Um, so this is a photograph of a different beach of that same project called Torrey Pines Beach, which is down near um, at the north end of the city of San Diego. And it's a sequence of photographs that show the beach before sand was placed there. That's in the upper photograph. This is a low tide figure or low tide photo that shows a very narrow dry beach with a little a lifeguard tower that's scooted way back in the back near the rocks. There's a rock slope revetment where all the cars are parked. And there's a big cobble berm in front of that lifeguard tower. So that shows that there's a teeny beach there that's high and dry. But then the middle photograph shows the project being constructed and sand being pumped on shore from the ocean, from a dredge, the beach being built. And then the bottom photograph shows after the beach was built. And it shows how wide the beach can get <laughs> from 250,000 cubic yards being placed there. This is the same quantity the Corps of Engineers is proposing, I believe, for your project. So it's a comparable site. And look at how wide that is on the lower photograph. That's good. The problem is this one didn't last very long, and there were several reasons for it. But nonetheless, it benefited this site and adjacent beaches for some period of time. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. A couple more projects. I'll be quick with these. Um, Seal Beach is a place that has homes that lie close to shore. They're relatively low in elevation. They're only, they're just about three feet above the highest high tide. And sometimes this beach gets so narrow that at high tides it overwashes. And the little photographic inset on the lower right shows a day in 1997 when there was a hurricane swell and a high tide combined and there was a narrow beach. And sure enough, the water went over the beach, went back to the homes and flooded the first floors. And the lifeguards had to take out their little inflatable to help get people out. That was not good. So Seal Beach, about 10 years later, they, they nourished recently after that event. Um, but then another 10 years later, the Corps of Engineers came in and built this beach with 75,000 cubic yards. And it's a nice white beach at that time. And it has remained in place ever since. They have had much less of a problem since this was done. This was also done with money fund, uh, given to them, a grant from the state of California Department of Boating and Waterways. Please advance to the last couple of slides on this particular subject. So then there's a, a beach up in Santa Barbara County <clears throat> that's been nourished several times. It's called Galita Beach Park. Galita Beach is one of these narrowing beaches in front of a county park. And there is another coalition in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties called the Beach Erosion Authority for Clean Oceans and Nourishment. Their acronym is B-E-A-C-O-N or BEACON. Beacon is a grouping of all of the coastal cities and both counties in Santa Barbara and Ventura County that banded together to do nourishment and they nourish Goleta Beach several times. They're trying to get more money to nourish other beaches and they haven't been very successful at securing funds yet. So they haven't gone very far, but they're trying. They're a joint powers authority. That's the type of coalition that might form in Southern Orange County. So please advance the slide. And then uh, the most recent one that happened was just a, an off project at San Alejo Lagoon down in Cardiff where sand was dredged out of the lagoon. It was placed on the nearby beach. It's 300,000 cubic yards and it, it widened the beach significantly. There's a before and after photograph here. They may or may not be that clear to you, but nonetheless, it was a very positive project for that region. They love getting sand and they're, look and they're part of the, this beach is included in the Sand Dag uh, Regional Beach Sand program so it may receive sand again so go ahead and advance okay so 
<clears throat> right now, the city of San Clemente is looking out for their own interests, which they should do, obviously. You're doing a great job of that. And you've got the Corps of Engineers trying to do a project for you, and you do smaller projects with opportunistic sand. If you added the arrow to your quiver, I guess is one way of saying it, of being in a coalition, you could potentially get additional sand. And what we're suggesting is if the coalition starts to form under the umbrella of the county, that we would suggest that San Clemente consider being a cooperative agency that is even a member of that coalition and can provide advice, maybe some resources, I don't know what form, staff time or something, and exert political pressure on those that are above these areas in the state to fund, provide money to fund the coalition. Go ahead and advance. There are, you know, pros and cons to staying, you know, within the city of San Clemente only with your actions or going out as a coalition. And, you know, some of the things about staying on your own is that you can get work done, but you're limited kind of in what you can, the scale of the work that can get done because there's, you only have so much money and you can only get so much money from other, from the state potentially. But if you form a coalition, our experience with SANDAG specifically, the San Diego Association of Governments, another coalition, is that there's power in numbers. It seems like the political ability of a coalition is far superior than a single agency. And a lot of them together can do can do a lot more than one agency can. And so they, you know, they would take trips to Sacramento together um, and they would harass whoever was in power that was their legislator and then take that guy to the governor and you know, do all sorts of cool things that help them get the money from the state to do it. Typically, if you band together, it can also cost less for each member of the agency to get the job done. Because as the amount of money or revenue that's available to do a project rises, the unit cost of the project goes down. So you can get more sand for the same amount of money than you would if, if you only were buying a small amount of sand. If you're buying a larger amount of sand, you get more for cheaper. So it essentially provides more benefits for everybody. And finally, it's, a, it's, it's easier to get approvals from the permit agencies, which can be a, a difficult, and Joreen knows, Joreen's with the, formerly with EPA, not trying to call you out, Joreen, by any stretch, but the agencies are protective and that's what their job is, specifically the Coastal Commission. And it can be difficult to secure permits for a project that you know, is the kind of project that you wanna do sometimes so coalitions can help because coalitions have more experience. They have more, like I said, more resources and more political will to actually advance things forward and put pressure on the right people to see to that the interests of the coalition are met. So with that, um, I think we're almost done here. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so some of, the some of the partners that have identified their interest in a coalition in South Orange County are the county, of course, the county's recently applied for money from a thing called Proposition 68, which is offered by the Ocean Protection Council. And their application for money was to get seed money to start the process of forming a coalition. They just submitted that in, in 2020, and they got interviewed um, as a finalist for this uh, funding source on Tuesday of this week. And I don't know how it came out, but we'll find out. The California State Parks Department is also interested in the coalition because of San Onofre State Beach and Doheny State Beach. Both are experiencing erosion and the, count, the state almost doesn't seem to know what to do about it. <sighs> City of Dana Point's interested. They've got problems. Capistrano Shores is interested. They've got big problems. The South San Clemente Homeowners Associations have approached us and we've actually gone there and done this similar presentation. They've got problems. They're interested. Um, the railroad. They got all sorts of problems. <laughs> Their solution is to place rock, which works great for the railroad. But guess what? It won't work forever. It's not a permanent thing. I mean, they need a beach in front of them too, because that's less rock they got to place and maybe no rock at all if it's a wide enough beach. They need their tracks dry. The South Coast Water District and the desal plan has indicated an interest because of their beach out infrastructure that they may be um, probably installing more of and larger of. And then Caltrans because there's roadways in the vicinity of all these places that are state roadways that are kind of vulnerable. So there's at least eight that would go in with you potentially. And so we're trying to help the county with whatever they need to do, just because we've seen it work. And personally, I know it works. And I'd love to see South Orange County get the same benefits as North Orange County does that I get to enjoy personally. 
So you could advance the slide, Cynthia. There's um, funding out there in, in this group, this national beach preservation group called American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, otherwise known as ASBPA, um, has put out some literature on how to get funding. Um, most of their funding is probably federal. We can help you understand state funding a lot better um, because we've helped cities secure state funding from the Department of Boating and Waterways, which is now under the umbrella of state parks. And then go to the last slide. I think this is the last slide. So the next steps, if you, if you feel prompted to continue thinking about this and carrying it forward would be to decide whether or not to support and participate in such a coalition, uh, maybe help with its formation, provide, provide political support to get it going and to keep it going, um, consider increasing the sand, number of sand placement sites within your city. I think the Corps of Engineers is proposing it um, from the T Street area through the pier and up north toward the lifeguard um, headquarter building, if I understand it right, but maybe there could be sand placed at the north end of town at the south end of town too. And then, uh, you know, continue participating to get something done. You can join and you can get it started, but until sand gets placed on the beach, it, you know, it's only so good, right? So we're trying to get the rubber to meet the road and see some work get done, you know, for the sake of the city and in lieu of things that may be looming in the horizon, like sea level rise and things like that. So with that, I'm, I'm done talking and I'd love to entertain any questions and clarify anything that needs to be clarified. Chris, I have a question, uh, if I may. Yes, Chris, go ahead. Um, how much does 2 million yards of uh, sand typically cost to place on a beach? For sand egg, it was $20 million. $20 million? $20 million. That was 2001. Now, I will tell you that in 2012, <clears throat> they put 1.5 million cubic yards and it cost $25 million. And I can explain the difference. The difference is that in 2001, the dredge came from a location that was relatively close by. So the amount of money required to mobilize the equipment from there to here was relatively low, I think a million dollars. In 2020, the dredge came from New Jersey. So it had to come from East Coast and go through the Panama Canal and it cost $9 million to mobilize. <clears throat> so let me, let me offer a thought on that. The, if the Corps of Engineers ends up doing a project um, in San Clemente anytime in the near future, one way to increase your um, benefit, if the coalition exists, is to approach the contractor separate from the Corps when the contractor is here already and negotiate a contract with the contractor to keep doing beach nourishment at these additional beaches. And the mobilization cost would be almost nothing because he's already here. So it would cut the cost down a lot. Taking advantage of something that's happening is something a coalition can potentially do too. Thank you. And, it, and you mentioned that uh, this lasts for five to six years before it has to be replenished? Um, probably more like 10. The first sand egg project lasted discernibly for six years. The second sand egg project was done with coarser grained, larger grain size sand and is still apparent in the system and measured. So it's been eight years. So the second project is still visible and still a, and still providing benefit. It's not entirely there, but it's not entirely gone. It's in the process of being dispersed. So the Corps of Engineers typically takes a 10 year interval between renourishments. A 10 year interval would do the job. Even if the beach completely disappeared before the 10 years is up, renourishing the beach would continue to add enough sand to the system gradually over time that that beach would grow and would probably remain almost entirely in place at some point in the future from the multiple renourishments. And you mentioned earlier that the sand moves south. Is there any way of slowing that uh, progression down? For instance, putting in uh, rock like the railroad suggested, but maybe going out? Is that yeah. something that you looked at? Yeah, those are called sand retention structures. Sand retention structures work. And um, by installing sand retention structures, you can slow the amount of sand, the rate of sand movement along the coast, and you can cause it to accumulate and 
grow beaches in particular locations if you choose to do that. Um, one example is the pier. Uh, the pier, the San Clemente Pier is a pier that's permeable to sand movement. Sand moves through it really swiftly. And it doesn't really slow sand down, I don't think. But I, the pier where I live in Huntington um, is comprised of these really large um, concrete piles that are about three feet in diameter. And they're close together enough that the sand slows down as it moves through the pier and settles out on both sides of the pier. So at the beach in Huntington Beach near the pier is really wide. And that's one sand retention um, structure that wasn't even built to be a sand retention structure, but it is. So there's ways to retrofit the pier to become more of a sand retention structure. There's also ways to install rock structures that you were talking about, such as jetties, um, uh, reefs, and things like that, that will hold sand behind them as well. Slow the motion of sand down. Okay, well, that's all I have for now, but uh, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome, sir. Anybody else have a question for Chris? Yeah, th this is Joe. I guess I got a couple items for you. So. So certainly appreciate your time. You know, I've been sitting on this committee for a while. I think we've had maybe you or other associates come in maybe four or five years ago, something like that, kind of talk to a similar project, right? And I believe the regional approach was on the table at that time, but it seems like it's picking up speed. So when we say regional, right, the, I understand the, like the littoral area or the littoral cell that impacts San Clemente is basically from the Dana Point headlands, right, down south, right? That's so. Correct. So when you say regional, you're really talking about placing sand on beaches south of, of the Dana Point headlands down, right? Or do you envision like Dana Point north of that area, like by Salt Creek Beach and that? No, you you have it right. <laughs> okay. okay, so so that's good. So it is kind of, I mean, it is regional, but relatively localized in terms of a Correct. small area. Correct. Uh, and then I guess the other thing I would say is, right, I, I believe this is part of working with the Corps of Engineers on their project. We did, I, I want to say the city and the Corps of Engineers executed an environmental impact statement like in the early 2010s, right, to, to support ultimately to make the decision about where to dump the sand right. and then ultimately to support the funding process. So obviously there's a lot of time involved and money involved in that in 2011. The way right. the environmental regulatory process has changed, certainly given the new administration, I, I don't envision that that's going to be an easy process. You know, and, and again, there's so I know there's a lot of commitments in that document, right? The 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 pre-project monitoring, the post-project monitoring, right? There's still a lot of hoops you got to jump through. Right. But my one fear that I maybe have is that is that going to reopen the door to say, okay, now we reopen up the NEPA process, and now we're looking at this whole thing, and then we're looking at, I mean, again, I don't the previous administration just, you know, I guess, current administration put in streamlining guidelines that's supposed to reduce the timeline for a, a new environmental impact statement. But the reality is, I mean, that, that's years potentially, right? So I, 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 I have some pause or some concern about potentially, you know, restarting the clock on like our planning process, but I, I certainly understand what your, what the goal would be uh, for the, the regional approach. Well, you know, um, if I may jump in then, uh, your concern is totally justified. And, you know, something San Clemente could do is be very clear with your and stipulate if you were to join or become a member of a coalition to say to all the other members, listen, we have this thing in process. We've gone through the hoops that you mentioned already. We do not want to reopen those. So anything that we are a part of and we propose shall not be something that would harm that effort or turn the clock back or reopen any doors. I think you could do that. Um, what well, what we would be recommending is you keep that Corps of Engineers process completely intact. No changes, nothing. In fact, if it could proceed and go ahead of any of this coalition stuff, that'd be even better because then you could see work being done. The agencies could too. Everybody could see how well it performs. And then you could rub your palms together and say, now that was cool. Let's do it with the neighbors and have them, their excitement levels will be through the roof if they were to see some success in San Clemente, right? I think anyway, so. Yeah, I agree. And I, and, I, I, and I think to your point though, so the, the South, the South San Clemente Neighbors Association, they're gonna, they're gonna get a, uh, they're gonna get a bump regardless, right? Even if they don't Absolutely. play stand on their own beach, but Capistrano Shores, they don't have that benefit based on the way the project is currently. Right. Like, you That's know? exactly right. Yeah. Direct and all that. Yeah. All right. I yeah. Thank you for your time. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Chris, I was going to speak later on on uh, some grants that are available, and maybe we can do that right now, and you can add in because I'd really like, and I think my colleagues would like your opinion on on the California shoreline erosion control and the public beach restoration grants. Uh, 
right. that are up now. And I think the deadline is February 1st, which is pretty, pretty quick for us. But, um, but for your, for your regional group that you're talking about, I don't know if you've talked to them, share them about the public beach restoration grants. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought it up, Jerry Ambrose. The, um, that program is the program that funded both of the SANDAG uh, Regional Beach Sand 1 and Regional Beach Sand 2 projects. They also funded the Seal Beach project in, that I showed you in 2009. So three of the projects, three of the five projects that I showed you were state funded through that program. Wow. And what that program provides, um, at least in my experience, is 85% of the funding of construction of your project. So if it's a $20 million project, they'll give you 85% of that and the, the remaining 15% is then um, uh, brought forth by the members, the cities. And that's when the cities divide up the remaining 15% and um, pay their fair share. And so it's not free, you know, there, there is some money involved, but it's, it's reduced significantly when the state ponies up. Now, I mean, I need to caution you about one thing. <clears throat> that program that did all that funding was, was a program that was underneath the, within the State Department of Boating and Waterways. Yes, that that program was a funding program, but that program got assumed or taken underneath the umbrella now of the state parks department. So the state parks department now covers all that and state parks has thus far not done the same thing as the Department of Boating and Waterways and they haven't been giving up as much grant funding, I think, toward this kind of thing as was um, given in the past. So. It, there may be a need to talk with state parks, learn more from them about their process and about what they really have in terms of funding and find out whether it's as lucrative as it was in the past. And maybe it is, and I don't know about it. It's very possible and I just need to get educated. But I know there's several agencies that are applying for money. City of Del Mar is applying for money. And I think the County of Orange is applying for money too from that program for this exact thing. Well, they're asking for applicants right now for the project, and it's being uh, marketed also through the California Coastal Commission. Good. That's terrific. The more applicants, the better, because it shows, it demonstrates interest on the part of the grantor that there's, you know, there's a demand for money out there. And if they can't keep up with the demand, then they may have justification for getting more money from the state in their budget to be able to fund it in the future. Exactly, because this, this is coming from state funds, right. not federal. It, it's actually, um, it's a gas tax on boaters. It's a revolving, ta right. it's a, a boater's gas tax that's been banked away. Very interesting. And yeah. then um, you can, do you want to hit on the California shoreline erosion and con control? Yeah, um, I think go it's, ahead, please. I think it's the same program underneath the same agency. And it I'm is. not sure what the subtle differences are between them. Well, I think that the erosion control is really dealing with armoring. Oh, okay. Other kinds of ways to prevent okay. other other kinds of alternatives to prevent erosion. Okay. What have you encountered? You gave us some examples when you were speaking. What have you encountered that that cities had to deal with in terms of preparing their beaches for the onslaught of storms, et cetera, in, in terms of beach restoration or beach preservation? Have you encountered cities? For example, Capistrano Beach is a good example right now. Mm -hmm. And that whole area, right. you have people down there who are wanting, of course, the people on Beach Road who are wanting, what do we do? Do we, oh, yeah. we want more armoring? We want to keep our homes that we just built, et cetera. Right. And of course, that's private property. Right. And then you've got that whole section there. We was just talking to somebody in Mike Levin's office today saying she went down to, to that area, that coast Capistrano Bay area, and just said she was shocked at how desecrated it's been it's just really i mean we might only be allowed to do a natural shoreline at that beach because i i don't see how it's going to be they're trying to do sand cubes right now and some other armoring right now with rip rack etc but um the california coastal commission did give them a temporary permit for six months with some show of an advance within 30 days and 60 days that is oc parks mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that, please? Well, <laughs> places like that are in dire straits right now and they're desperate for solutions. And right now there aren't any obvious or easy solutions. So our understanding is if they have the opportunity to be a part of a group that would have sand placed just up the coast from them, 
maybe at Doheny State Beach, they mm -hmm. would be doing backflips to, to have that happen. Um, I'm sure the coastal, com I'm sure there'll be an onslaught of potential applications to fortify their rock slope protection or the revetments in front of their homes yeah. um, and maybe even raise them up. But I, I don't know how willing the Coastal Commission is to issue permits to do that because I think they'd rather see the homeowners retreat their homes. Yes. Which I don't know even how technically feasible that really is to do. So the, the Coastal Commission has been saying that they, they believe sand is a good answer, a adaptation strategy for future sea level rise conditions. And I think they'd be more willing to consider a sand project than a rock project. Yes. The, the rock project works really well right away where the sand project takes time to get sand placed in the system and have it move down toward your area. And then multiple projects potentially after that to consider, to continue to widen your beach. But it's the dynamics of the rocks is the same as the armoring. So when the waves come in again, you know, it'll hit the rocks and the bigger the rocks, the more sand is going to be taken away. Well, you know, a lot of people say that. I'm not of that opinion that rocks cause the erosion. I think the rocks are placed because there's been erosion. I don't think the rocks cause it. I think the rocks protect the homes. The waves do wash up and back down again off the rocks, but I don't see that the rocks do a lot of the direct causes of the erosion. I think it's the other way around. The oh, I think happens. I think it's, I agree with you. I think it's, they're put there for protection. Right from the water after the yeah. damage has been done. Exactly. I don't think they caused the problem in the first place. I think they're a reaction to the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a good reaction if you've got a home right there. It's the only thing that works. And another question for you, Chris, along that line about the railroad, because you know that that area there in Capistrano will be, it's, I think somebody from Surfrider uh, indicated that it was only 12 when the waves were high, when the tide was high and during the storms and the king tides. It was only 12 feet from the tracks. Oh, that, I know that's pretty crazy. That's, so there yeah. is a committee with the railroad right now, and I think it's sponsored by OCTA and Caltrans, et cetera, the railroad. Right. I know uh, Mike Levin's office is involved with that as well, and probably some other legislators. But if you're talking about different cities and you're talking about the power of individual leaders of those cities, be there, be them stakeholders or uh, government people, I say that loosely, you know, people serving in local governments, et cetera, or in county or regional governments, these people can bring to the table more weight, just as you're suggesting, Chris, um, in a, for example, the table at, with the railroad committee. I don't know if you know any of the players on that or if you and your firm are involved in that. I think, um, is Leslie uh, uh, in your committee, in your, um, is Moffitt part of what? What's, Cynthia, what's Leslie's last name? Meyerhoff. Meyerhoff, yeah. Is she working for Moffitt not right no, now? No, no, no. Uh, Leslie is working as a planner. She's got her own company. Okay. And she's a city planner. But, so, no, she's not part of our group, but we know her. We are familiar with Leslie. She, okay. She was, she was involved with those sand egg projects with both of them. Yeah. She was for the city of Solana Beach. So she's very familiar with that whole approach. And she was a consultant for the city of San Clemente and still is as well, too. Correct. On, on our sea level rise and resiliency plans, et cetera, for the right. LCP. But um, but I'm just wondering if you would be interested. It seems like you may want to find out more about that railroad commission or committee, whatever it's called. You know, usually something like the Blue Ribbon Committee attracts a lot of people like yep. you because the big players, the stakeholders are in those committees. Right. And it would be interesting to find out what they're dealing you know what they're talking about what are the alternatives what are they willing to do yeah because and the railroad also and i mean sandeg has already gotten some money to do some railroad uh retreat isn't that correct well sandeg has gotten money to do various things with the railroad retreat is not one of the things that i understand they're doing right now they may retreat it from del mar yeah. in the far future but that's a distant thing where they would you know tunnel underneath del mar and put the track there but Nobody's doing that anytime soon, from my understanding. Okay. I think that's a future plan. Okay. I had just heard that they were doing some studies to that effect. They are initiating some studies to do that, correct. Okay. We, right. we, we, will, we will try to um, invite ourselves to the Railroad Committee as well. I'm, I appreciate you mentioning that to us. We have not been involved with that, and I don't know what they're doing, and I'd like to know. 
and notify them of this opportunity. Maybe they want to be a part of it. And help well, out. that's what I was thinking. I mean, if, if that would be a perfect place for you to, to give a position, you know, a presentation like this. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you for the suggestion. You're welcome. My pleasure. Any other questions for Chris Webb? Uh, I have just a couple of questions and, and comments. Um, Go ahead, Joreen. Yeah, so, so the first thing is regarding um, Okta and the railroad. So um, back when San Clemente, we put together a sea level rise vulnerability assessment. In that document, we identified that um, Okta was working on something, and I'll tell you the title, it's called OC Rail Infrastructure Defense Against Climate Change. And they said that Okta was gonna be working with a bunch of different partners on strategies on climate change and that there was a bunch of money that was poured into this document. And that was something that I had identified as a potential um, to, to use for beach nourishment. So that's something that has kind of been in the background when we haven't heard too much about what they're doing, but that was um, something I really wanted to find out more on and see how S City of San Clemente could be involved. And then secondly, like, I mean, I've been on the Coastal Advisory Committee for a couple of years and from day one, this is what Chris is talking about is something I've wanted the City of San Clemente to do. And I've been very supportive. And in fact, I've even written letters, you know, in the sea level rise study asking the city to join a regional type of force or help to form. And I'm really excited to hear that the County of Orange is interested in taking a leadership role because I think in the past, you know, city of San Clemente couldn't really be that leader. We would probably be a part of it, but um, I think that's really exciting to hear. And I do think that the regional effort is, is the way to go. Um, this is how these projects get done. And without that, you know, I think, you know, just going on your own, you're, it, it becomes very difficult. And this is something even I've identified with the federal project. And as much as I love that project, it really is only for a very, you know, small section in our town and we have problems in other areas and places like North Beach, there's no plan for North Beach right now. We have no, no sand going there, sand's continually eroding and that area is gonna to continue to be a problem unless we come up with a solution. And I see something like this regional group being able to help address problems in North Beach that the federal project won't be able to address. And I do see the federal project and this being two totally separate projects. I agree with what Chris had said before that we, you know, we really need to keep pushing on the federal project, making sure that's moving forward and that whatever we do doesn't interfere with that. So I think that's really important. I also think that having a regional group, so in addition to beach nourishment could be very helpful if there's a project in the future, like um, more artificial reefs or some offshore sand retention ideas and and that's you know we know that's where the state's going we know that's where the funding's going and if if we have a regional group it's more likely that the project would be happening in our neighborhood because we'd be able to get um, grant funding for that so i think that's important um the other thing is as far as partners do you know um is southern california edison because i know they have the power plant are they interested are concerned about beaches. I didn't know if they could be a potential partner as well. I, I'm not sure that they are. I mean, they, they might be, we haven't approached them. So honestly, I don't know, but um, we can look into that. I, I, I understand the decommissioning of the nuclear generating station may take their interest, dampen their interest a little bit, uh, but you never know. Maybe they have other facilities that are still vulnerable that could use a beach in front of them and they might want to be involved. We can look into that. Right. And so it, I'm trying to think about if there's anything else I have, I have to add. I mean, I have my comments that I had written to the city um, I mean, that I think I, I've, I've talked about. You know, I said that the city must pursue partnerships with the county, Okta, Caltrans, City of Dana Point, California State Parks to implement a regional strategy. So I've been pretty. Oh. <laughs> you already did this pitch. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> yeah, well, that got sent into the city along with comments, but but like I said, there really wasn't that galvanized leader. Um, I think that could help kind of coalesce this, but um, it's it's something I've always been supportive of. So thank you Sorry. for coming. Do you have that list in front of you? Would you read the other recommendations? Because they were all put in the D-level rise uh, documents than when we were giving input. And uh, Jareen and I were both on the same bandwagon and she got very detailed. I went in a general route, but I really want everybody to hear your comments again, Jareen. I said, we need somebody at the table when OCTA starts to get together with Caltrans and the railroad. And so, uh, it was Leslie who said, we're gonna work really hard to get somebody at the table. She's at the table along with Cecilia from community development. Okay. So, um, but please, if you've got those comments, I think that would be very important right now to hear them again. I, I, I mean, do you The want... items that you suggested for the sea level rise? Yeah, I, I mean, I could, it's a pretty detailed, um, write up that I, I had. Um, so I don't know if you want me to read it or I could just forward it on so that committee members can read it or Chris, I could also forward it to Chris. I'd love to see it if you wouldn't mind sharing it at some point, Commissioner yeah. Doreen. You want to take about five minutes to give us the highlights and then forward it on through Cynthia or for yourself? Um, yeah, well, why don't, I, if you want, I could read, why don't I just read what I wrote in the very beginning, um, which is two paragraphs that just sort of address my overall concern. So, um, so here, here we go. So it, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the city of San Clemente sea level rise vulnerability assessment, the, which is the SLRVA. The SLRVA conclusions on impacts to San Clemente beaches are rather alarming and we should all be concerned about the future of our beaches and our coastal resources that will be lost in the near term due to sea level rise. I'm providing comments in my individual capacity as a San Clemente citizen, although I do also serve as vice chair on the city of San Clemente's coastal advisory committee. The CAC did receive an overview of the SLRVA during their August meeting and unfortunately, I was on a family vacation and could not provide in-person comments. I encourage the city to take immediate action. The city must continue to move forward with the federal sand replenishment project. However, this is not enough. North Beach will be lost if a comprehensive strategy is not undertaken to mitigate erosion and sand loss in that area. The city must pursue partnerships with the county, Okta, Caltrans, City of Dana Point, Sandag, California State Parks to implement a regional strategy or forge ahead on a plan to save our beaches through individual city action. The city should develop a working group with local businesses and interested stakeholders to explore public-private opportunities to advance beach nourishment and coastal adaptation strategies because our beaches are central to quality of life in San Clemente. Lastly, the city should invest in educating its residents about the impacts of city level rise on our beaches. So that's the overall um, commentary on that. And then I have some detailed comments uh, that I provided to the city. I think that's wonderful. And I think that um, we should resurrect that. And I think it would be helpful too. You know, Chris, Here's an opportunity. We have somebody right on our own committee who would be a gr great asset to this effort. And, Absolutely. And some of us as well. And uh, so you may want to, you know, I, Doreen, I know you're extremely busy yourself, but maybe if there's a way that you could be a link from our committee, if, if it's agreeable to our, to my colleagues here to connect with Rick on this regional effort, would you be interested in doing something like this? Yeah, I mean, this has always been really something I've been passionate about and really wanted, yeah. have wanted for our city for so long. And so, you know, anything I could do to help with that, I think I'd be happy to do. Would there be room for something like that, Chris, with, with your group? Yeah, you bet. Are you kidding me? It'd be well, absolutely welcome and wonderful. Very wonderful. productive. Thank would, you. Would everybody, how does everybody in our group feel? I'd like to. I'd like to make this an official endorsement of Doreen to be our, our conduit to Chris in this regional effort. 
can we do a straw vote here? I'd like to nominate, even though we're not asking for action. If I have to nominate, I will do so in a straw vote. Uh, I would be nominating Jareen to be our CAC representative to work with Chris Webb and his group of, on the regional, what are you calling yourselves, Chris? Regional Beach Sand Coalition. Okay, on the Regional Beach Sand Coalition. Um, can we go down the list and can I have your I vote if you agree to that? Cynthia, could you go down the roster, please? Oh, sure. Um, Gary McCacken. Oh, we lost Gary. Uh, Joe Zidron. Aye. Uh, Doreen. <laughs> Do I vote for me? <laughs> Chris Kaczynski. Uh, aye. Charlie Smith. Aye. Let's go back to Gary McCack and see if he's in there. And then Susan. Let me see if I'm, I'm an I'm an I. So I stopped sharing. I hope that was okay, you guys. That's okay. Oh, Gary's, I see his office, but I don't see him. Yeah. Well, I think we have enough from uh, the, the rest is unanimous. I mean, the rest of us are unanimous in our straw vote. So, um, so done. And Susan, I have a question about that. I mean, I think it's great to have, you know, our committee support and a representative from our committee. But I also think that this issue, it's important for our city council to see an overview of the, of the issue and then also endorse that the city participate in such a process. So what would that process look like for us to get this issue in front of council and get their eyes and ears on it? That question is directed to Cynthia because I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's a city council question. Oh, here comes Gary back. Um, Gary, we're gonna, we're gonna touch base with you after we deal with this with Doreen's question. I think that's very important that we do that. Yes, I think that you could make a recommendation to the city council that you encourage their participation in the regional beach sand coalition. I mean, you could actually make that as a, a motion and, and a second and vote on it if you'd like. Has anybody talked to Tom Bonnegan about this, Chris, have you? Actually, we, we have had discussions with Mr. Bonnegat and the city manager, and they both are interested in the idea. They're okay. aware of it. Yeah. All right. In fact, they're the ones that suggested we reach out and present to the Coastal Advisory Committee. So it was their uh, idea to come to you in the first place. Well, see, we do magic here. So I guess I my question then is, is that something we could do and feel comfortable doing tonight based on the information that was presented? Do you feel comfortable taking that forward? And does Chris feel comfortable taking that forward to a city council? Are you, have you spoken before other city councils? I, I have several times, but not about this specific item, but other items related to the beach. Okay. I mean, I guess, do we have a good answer about whether there's any, I mean, because I think one of the questions they would have is about fiscal, is there any fiscal commitment to being a part of this? Too yeah. early to know. Yeah, I, I think the wise, sorry, I didn't mean to just butt in if, if that's okay, oh. I'll tell you that the County of Orange, we should reach out to the County of Orange representative, Susan Broder with OC Parks and ask her about the status of her application to the state. And then um, if she has any details or she knows of any of this information because my sense is it's too early to know because there hasn't been a formation yet of this group so oh there, okay there needs to be some understanding of who's in it and <laughs> then how to conduct it and and how to form it is it a joint powers authority is that what what it is is it something different a geologic hazard abatement district i mean there's a lot of different ways to form an agency that can fund itself or apply for and apply for money to other agencies. And I just don't know exactly what this thing looks like yet, to be honest with you. 
Well, that's why I'm mentioning these grant opportunities. Right. Uh, that would be very helpful in setting something up that would do exactly what we're asking for right now. Right. Absolutely. But they have oh. very short drop deadlines right now. I'll, I'll just 20, interject and say that. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Susan. I'm sorry. For 22-23 budget from the state, uh, you have to have your application in by February 1st of this year. Let's let's ask the county if the county is intending to apply and if they've done any work on that. And maybe we could help them get an application in that covers this subject. So at least it's in the queue, whether it gets awarded or not, at least the state knows about it. And then it can go in next year if it didn't get awarded. Well, then going with Doreen's question, which was an excellent one, I think it's it's a little premature to go to the city council right now until you can until you have a body that's established to a point where you can identify yourself as either a joint power or under the auspices or umbrella of the county or, and who are the, identify the players? I would, I would, I kind of disagree. I would think that we can make a recommendation to the council, even though it's not formed because the city needs to participate in this formation. Yeah. And there's, some, and I'll say also too, that there's some political will around this uh, with the campaign that we just ran. There was a number of people that were aware that this was an issue and it was talked about. So, okay. It might be wise to strike while the iron's hot. Right. And I'd be willing okay. to make a motion that we recommend to the council that they continue to pursue this opportunity. Well, the presentation would have to be made as, as Chris just indicated, Chris Webb, that is, uh, that he would have to go to the county and see what their interest would be. We could still make our recommendation, but it would be nice to know that information from Chris would be nice to know going in to make a recommendation. Well, I can tell you right now, the county's completely interested. I, I have the county's blessing right now yeah. speaking to you because I asked them if I could, and I even shared the content with them and asked them for their opinion. So the county's fine with this. They're fine with you know, us talking about it with you and having your council consider it while they're trying to get money to get it started. They'd love to have you as a member. I, I you know, it's a little early, but yeah, they, San Clemente is a strategic city. It is. <laughs> with big problems. Well, that's you, you, are, you are influential and having you on board would be key. Without you, without San Clemente, it's going to have a big hole in the middle of it. Wouldn't we, it wouldn't work. Yes. Well, Jermaine, how do you feel about that? You'd, you'd have to, and I know you're busy, but so I keep saying that, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of that. And you're also our rep on the, uh, on the, uh, Cynthia, help me out. The pure on bacterial. The, thank you. The pure bacteria, oh, right. which is kind of floating around right now. But um, at, actually, that is, actually, that's a win-win there because they're both intertwined in some fashion. Um, so in some ways, but you'd have to get together with Chris and, and make a presentation. I, I support that motion that Gary just made um, and that we talked about before Gary made the motion. I support that uh, in further thought here, but we'd have to go in practiced, if you will, confident, if you will. Yeah. I guess my recommendation, I don't think we would be recommending that the city council receives a certain or specific presentation, right? I think the recommendation I see going to council is that, and I see it being two faceted. One, we recommend we continue to stay on the path and pursue the federal program. There's been a lot of time, energy, and money sunk into that. But yeah. we would also recommend at the same time that the city, you know, consider or this, or we recommend the city council join or explore further uh, the, the opportunity for partnership with regional partners, like something like that, you know? And I think it's up to the city council if they want to, you know, see, see a presentation. I mean, I think it would be helpful to give it to them, but I don't think the motion itself is that, you know, we, we present at the council, right? I don't think that's the well, motion. And I, I completely agree with Joe. I think it creates an avenue for them to, to, um, you know, this is, I, I think in some respects, this has been a little bit of a black hole. Uh, and, and it seems like to a degree that there's, that there, that there's a plan that's, that it's formulating and 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 to Joe's point, right? The question is, do we do we jump on board, right? And 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 be involved, and and help the process move forward. And I I have a feeling that, uh, you know, the money the money is going to be the tricky part, 
obviously, but uh, to the degree that uh, you know that we can be innovative and, and think, so, think outside the box to, to, to uh, try to come up with the funds, uh, I, I think that's a win-win. Yeah, I mean, at least from my perspective, I actually think it's important for the council to see the presentation that we saw tonight, just because I feel like a lot of those images are so powerful. And I do think that this is something that really I haven't heard talked about at the council level um, for a long while. And I do think it should be kind of brought into the forefront because I think it's important to everybody. I mean, this is important to the city of San Clemente. This is important to all of our citizens. You know, almost everyone can agree that more sand on our beaches is is better for us. So I think there'd be actually a lot of interest in the presentation that that Chris gave, and to see that like firsthand some of those aerial photos that really showed some of the benefit to you know these these projects. And and I think I think that could be actually beneficial for for council. So I would recommend that they do see the presentation and the photos and that they could really, you know, maybe make this a priority. I, I agree with that. Completely agree with that. Yeah, but I, I'm just saying in terms of the language in the motion, should it say we want them to see a presentation or, or should it say we want them to explore further opportunities to start in this coalition? That's just what I was thinking in terms of trying to wrap something into a motion. Well, but I agree. I think it'd be helpful if they- if My motion would say that we can, that they continue to explore this opportunity. My personal opinion is you want the city to join the, to join it and hopefully it will be a, like a JPA because in Downey when I was on the council we formed several GPAs that involved like Interstate 5 that involved the gateway system from the harbor of Los Angeles and also the Los Angeles and Rio Hondo River and if you're not a part of that JPA you usually don't enjoy the benefit of the money when you get the approval so it's, you don't want to be timid about it. I mean, my personal opinion is you want to be a part of the, J, the JPA if you want to save your beaches, you know, to be the coalition to get that money because that's the most favorable way you got it. And both the LA River Coalition and the San Gabriel Watersheds, you know, IPA and our joint powers in Downey have all been successful in getting hundreds of millions of dollars that you know, have improved the city in indirect ways. When you talk about like the gateway cities, we got multiple millions of dollars to improve the traffic signalization system in the city so that trucks could get off the 710 freeway. That would have never happened if we weren't part of the JPA. Well, I think with a new city council, I think um, two of the members at least, and I think in this configuration of the city council plus, Tomorrow, they are going to be, I think, appointing a city manager. At least it's on the agenda for a special meeting. Um, I don't know if they're narrowing down the candidates or actually selecting somebody tomorrow, but I'll be tuning into that. I, I think that we should do the two-pronged approach in, in that motion. I think that, um, Gary, do you want to say that again? And I think I, I want you to... I want Joe's motion to be blended with you. I think that makes the most sense. Joe, would you repeat yours? Uh, so I, I would make a motion to the effect of um, uh, the CAC, essentially the, you know, the CAC supports the council, uh, explore further the opportunity uh, to partner or to, to partner with our with uh, with other agencies in the region to address uh, holistically uh, a salmon punishment program for South Orange County. Uh, while at the same time continuing to pursue uh, the city's project with the, or the city's federal project, something like that, right? That would be, that would be the extent of the motion, right? I would. I would reverse those, but Cynthia, I see you wanting to thank you for that. Cynthia. We're going to have an update. I'm going to read what Tom Bonnegat um, has an update on the federal project, which sounds like it's going to be moving forward. So I don't know if you need a motion for that. Just a recommendation. And I have a recommendation on language for a motion to city council to consider pursuing participation in the formation of a regional beach sand coalition organization. That's fine. Perfect. And yeah. That's what Gary kind of had suggested, had motioned earlier. Yeah. I don't think, I think we should keep it simple. Don't mix it with the other. 
because I think the council has the intention of proceeding with the other. Yeah. I, don't, I think I, I think including it would have been is a supportive a supportive uh, pat on the back for the support they've given the Army Corps of Engineering project thus far and to Tom Bonnegut's efforts as well. So we have supported that always. It's always come to Coastal Commission, I mean, to a Coastal Advisory Committee to vote on uh, grant, you know, the more monies, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it, it's incumbent upon us to mention that. Okay. And My then motion. And we've been. Can you both? Yeah. You can take a vote. Yeah. So, well, I also, oh. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see Cynthia's update, but as long as I've been doing it to, to Chris's point, when there's grant applications that are filed on behalf of the city, it's Tom that's doing it, right? We used to apply a lot of pressure and saying, we're going straight to the voting waterways. And yeah. Tom would say, stop, stop. Like, that's if right. it, if it, like we'll put the permit in. So I, I'm confident, you know, to, like if this is a February 1st deadline, I'm confident Tom is, is, if he wants the city to be positioned, he would do it, right? Just just one, one, piece, one piece there though, <laughs> to Cynthia's point though, um, it, it, to the degree that we can, and I don't know how we do it, but if we can fold in the recommendation that the that the council hear from Chris Webb uh, to Joreen's Jor point earlier, I think that yeah. would be really important. Uh, you know, <clears throat> one thing I'll just mention, hopefully I didn't say this already. Um, I think there's a lot of miseducation as it pertains to this particular issue. Um, you know, I can remember when I ran for council, there was a lot of people that came back after me on this particular point and, and pointed out some of the things that, um, you know, that Chris mentioned tonight that were not correct. Um, and, and I, you know, I didn't really have the, the ammunition to be able to sort of, uh, you know, kind of tell them that they were wrong per se. And I wasn't really in a position to be able to tell them they're wrong. And it, it's not a fight per se, but it just, uh, I, just to Jorian's point, I think it's important that people are educated, and I think there's a lot of people that don't understand this, both on council and and obviously within within the city. So, um, to the you know, if if we can, Cynthia, if we can fold in a recommendation to have Chris give the same presentation that he did to the um, the coastal advisory here, that I I think that would be important. Well, Cynthia's staff, it's the committee that makes that decision of what we're going to say. Understood. I'm just talking about the motion, Susan. Yeah. Yeah, and one more thing to, to add in, and this it sort of it backtracks a little bit, but another benefit that that we do have with this is if everyone remembers, we did have an opportunistic permit with the Army Corps of Engineers that we let expire. And that currently, if, unless it was renewed without my knowledge, I think that was something that we had let expire. And so right now, I don't think we could even legally put on any opportunistic sand on our beaches. And so another benefit to going through this, and a lot of it was because of the money to renew the permit and getting consultants and et cetera on board. And so if we did have this regional group, they could pursue you know, a regional permit. So that would be another benefit. You are right. And we, we let, that was at the request of Tom Bonnegut for the reasons that you said, but we didn't we put a caveat in there that he had to come back if there were other areas that needed opportunistic sand, he would open it up again. And he was to come back with a report, I think on an annual basis. Yeah, yeah we did file a motion supporting Tom's desire to end the opportunistic sand program temporarily. And, but I think there was language in there to continue pursuing the long-term program. Yeah, and we he, had, he had a whole bunch of like, I, I think it was, pre-survey, post-survey monitoring and, and the costs involved in the program. It just wasn't right. Yeah, it, it, can you find that somewhere where we made that motion and had the caveat? You don't have to do it right now, but could you look up in the records to find out where that motion is? When, when Tom came to us to ask us for the, uh, to allow the expiration of opportunistic sand. I think, yeah, I think one of the key parts of that was that it was so expensive just on one city uh, for the opportunistic sand projects that I almost think it's probably if you can get involved in a regional coalition that you're going to get more bang for your buck with the amount of money that the city individually is going to be able to contribute on a regional project rather than the individual project would be kind of my understanding. But I can find that uh, motion and, and forward that to the CAC. Yeah, and the caveat that we put on there as well. Thank you. But I agree. And that's what this is all about, the regional effort. Okay. Um, 
Well, Cynthia gave the last motion for consideration. We're kind of pinging around here, but we wanted to add Doreen's comment as well. Um, Cynthia, what was yours? Did you write yours down? Yeah, it says um, motion to city council to consider pursuing participation in the formation of a regional beach sand coalition organization. Well, why don't we say what it is? A regional beach sand coalition organization. Yeah, we don't have to say organization. It's, it's uh, what, yeah, you can, you can get rid of organization. Yeah, because we're, we're identifying what you're calling yourselves, correct? And then, um, but where are we including um, the uh, educational component? You're asking me? Yes. In your motion, where are we including the educational component? It's not my motion. And um, I, well, doesn't that kind of become redundant? Because let the council consider joining the coalition, the education will follow. You know, all of that will happen. Well, no, we're, what we're saying, what Doreen is saying and, and Chris is saying is that the presentation should go along with the motion. We're what? asking for the presentation to be made to the city council and consider joining and consider adjoining. Chris, what's, what's, the four, what's the four words again? Beach Sand, wait, Regional Beach Sand Coalition. There you go. There you go. We want a presentation as well as- okay, and Just to, add and presentation by Mr. Webb. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I Don't second it. Your needs. Votes. <laughs> oh, somebody needs to make the motion. I, 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 I was, move. Wasn't it Gary? I thought Gary was kind of started that motion. Made. So move. Gary, second. Well, wait, Gary, what was your motion again then? Well, we just said to recommend the council pursue the formation of the coalition with a presentation by Mr. Webb. From the blank, the blank, blank, blank. Well, the coalition's before that, so. Okay. Regional Beach Sand Coalition, second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimously voted. Um, you know, I when you when we see the presentation, though, just a, a, a point of clarity here. Even though we just voted, I'm hoping that Jereen would get to interface with that presentation with you, Chris, which is one All of right. the reasons yeah. I mentioned asked offered her asked her if she would offer her help. That would be wonderful. Anything okay. you folks want to do with it would be just fine. If it's going to your council, you can have it any way you want it. That's totally fine. All right. So good. I feel good about that, Jerry. Yeah. No, I'm, we've cast you in a role, so I know. But I this is something we've wanted to do for a long time. So this was a very appropriate time to hear this. Terrific. And with with that, um, Chris, I, I invite you to stay to listen to Cynthia's report from Tom Bonnegut, if you like. That's coming up right now. Ma Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, Dave Riebensdorf. Um, oh, hi, Chris, Dave. How are you this evening? Very good, thank you. Um, I, I have a question for Chris. Um, while the the focus of this, you know, regional coalition is you know South County, um, and you talked about benefits of being a larger group, would do you think there would be any interest for um, the coalition to be countywide? and potentially include, you know, areas like Huntington Beach where you live and, and, you know, would it potentially become more powerful if it was countywide, something similar to what Sandag has, or um, do, do you think there would be no interest in that potentially from North County? Yeah, I think there's always the potential for interest. I, I have no doubt that there would be some folks interested and some folks not. I think it would be a good question to ask folks maybe like the county to see what the county thinks about that. Um, and if they have an opinion on whether they'd like to expand it or keep it relatively small. My, my concern about going too far geographically is that I think the diversity of interests might start kind of diluting it, where I think in your area, your geographic area, you've got a lot of common interests and a lot of common problems and they're solvable probably more effectively with just bombarding your relatively limited geographic coastline with sand and I think if you start to take other um, cities into consideration that already have wide sandy beaches, they might be like, well, we're not that, they might not be quite as enthusiastic and quite as knowledgeable about what needs to be done. I'd limit it for now. And if it seems like you need more support, then consider expanding it later. Okay, thank you. 
And also Dave and Chris, you might know about this, the California Coastal Commission operates with a coastal zone, man you know, there's a coastal zone management act. Right. So they've already broken up certain areas of the coastline into specific coastal zones, right. depending on what their needs are and what services are needed yep. and can be given. So right. we have to keep that in mind. But that was a good thought, Dave. Thank you for sharing that. All righty. Cynthia, will you repeat that motion just for us so we have it all in writing? Uh, sure. A motion from the CAC to the City Council to consider pursuing participation in the formation of a regional beach sand coalition with a presentation by Mr. Webb to the City Council. What do, is that where? Okay. Um, do we want to say the word consider? Don't we want to be more matter of fact and just we're recommending that we join? I think we voted, right? The motions. Said yeah, motions I know we voted, but I but I'm just thinking of yeah. considers really not necessary. But anyway, okay. Since we voted, we will move along. Um, if there's any other questions for Chris, now's the time to ask them. Otherwise, we're going to move along. I have oh, Karine, yes, please. One last question for Chris. What in your experience has been the role of nonprofit organizations in these regional sand groups? Because in San Clemente, we obviously have a few organizations. So Surfrider being probably our primary organization. And I don't really know what their official stance is on putting sand back on beaches. Is this is something that's a priority for them or would they have interest in this or not really? Well, we get a mixed answer sometimes from Surfrider. But to start with answering your question, nonprofit organizations are typically included as stakeholders in the process. And typically we conduct or the, the coalition would conduct stakeholder meetings and let the stakeholders voice their opinions, offer their input. Maybe they've got wonderful ideas that nobody's thought of, et cetera. How to do it sensitively and acceptably to the environment, that kind of thing. Surfrider in particular has been involved with the Sandag projects as a stakeholder. And, and Surfrider has been clear that structures are a big no. If a hard structure is a no, no matter what it is. But sand is, you know, can be okay. It depends on where and how much. If it affects a surf in a detrimental way, it's probably a no. If it can help a surf or be benign to the surf, it's a sure, why not? As long as it doesn't hurt the environment. So it seems to um, be that sand is more acceptable than anything else. And as long as it's done sensitively, they can not oppose it. But their whole purpose, I think, and their function is to actually oppose something that they don't agree with. So we would know it really soon and really quick. And I think it'd be important to have Surfrider at least not opposing it when it goes to coastal, if that's possible, because then coastal listens to that stuff very closely. And if they don't hear objections from the Surfrider you know, regional chapter, uh, which I think is in San Clemente, um, then maybe it would be a little easier for them to approve it, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Now I have one more question for Chris as well, as, well, as long as we, I brought up the, the aspect of the Coastal Zone Management Act. You know, there's also, I was also gonna to speak tonight on the California Coastal Commission Coastal Management Program in general, and the fact that they are giving grants through NOAA uh, it's, it's section 309, assessment and strategy, as part of the federal bill. And uh, they're looking for the grants for phase one in the assessment is wetlands, coastal hazards, public access, marine debris, cumulative and secondary and impacts, special area management planning, ocean and Great Lakes resources, of course, energy and government facilities, siting, and aquaculture. They go on into phase two of coastal hazards, public access, again, marine debris, and special area management planning. And they have applications for each of those categories. Okay. Some of those might be applicable in terms of yeah. getting funds for sure. what we're talking about. Absolutely. I, I think this everybody ought to be looking at all the possible funding sources and then just throw, if possible, apply, even if it's kind of tangential. And if, if the F, if the resource is there to make the application and the timing is there, enough time to do it, then I think it should be worth considered. Or cons yeah, worth considering. So I don't know much about that. I'd like to learn more about it. So thanks for bringing it up. I'll look into it. 
Oh, it's on the homepage of the Coastal, uh, the Coastal Commission. They had a, in their meeting yesterday, I tuned in, I zoomed in with them and uh, actually I did the live streaming with them and all day long and <coughs> pardon me, they had a good, a, a good amount of discussion on this topic and the various people across the state who talked about opportunities and what they wanted to do, et cetera. Right now they were only giving people two to three minutes to talk. Mm -hmm. But you could see the level of interest already building in the state once this notice has gone out. And I think this was on our agenda. Maybe we would think about making a presentation or a proposal ourselves. Mm -hmm. But again, the deadline is, I think, January 20th, if we want to, to offer some vocabulary there. So that's, that's, again, a short window. But I don't know, these popped up and we... We, we keep digging and digging. Sometimes we unearth things that are well hidden and sometimes they become visible at the last minute because right. that's why it was really crowded for them to give. And they went they, they went from, um, I, said, I started watching at nine and I think they closed down at 7.30 p.m. Wow. <laughs> I didn't make it to, through the whole thing, but it was, it was a very long, it was only, not only on that topic, but many of the topics were related to this kind of thing and the grants, so. Uh, food for thought to keep in mind. And sure. Jareen, too, you're such a great writer. This might be something you might want to look at and churn out as well. Well, I have uh, nothing else to add, and I'm going to recommend that we go on to the next agenda item, which would be Cynthia giving us a, a review of Tom Bonnegut's presentation. Cynthia, would you mind, please? I'm going to read this to you uh, just straight from his email. Here are some key points for current status of our Army Corps sand replenishment project. We are currently in the pre-construction engineering and design phase and below our remaining activities. Biological monitoring. The required pre-construction monitoring has been completed. Beach monitoring. Monitoring complete and awaiting data and final report delivery expected end of this month, which would be January. Economic reevaluation report. Analysis continues for the economic reevaluation analysis for the San Clemente Shoreline Project and prepared a required economic reevaluation report. Total project cost summary updated and provided to city. The current total project estimate is $15.1 million. Design docs. There's work underway on the design documents that includes the design report, plan and specifications, value engineering to be conducted in February, 2021 of the 35% design documents, <clears throat> draft schedule for final plans and specs estimate to be completed in April, 2021 for contract advertisement in June or July of 2021. And that's pe pending funding. <clears throat> and then the schedule, if fiscal year 2021 work plan funding for construction is received, the core would advertise for construction bids in early summer 2021 with the notice to proceed that summer. Construction could start fall of 2021. And then for construction, the draft project partnership agreement for the construction provided to the city to start review. And finally, staff will submit another grant funding application to the state for additional construction phase funding to help reduce the city's project contribution. So that's what I have. All of us have a copy of that, do we not? You sent one? I did not forward it to the CAC. I can forward the email to the CAC. Yes, would you please? You got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So did we assume that that federal funding got authorized? Because if, if they're talking about awarding this year, then it would have been in a FY21 enacted budget, presumably, or they maybe they already have funding. Like, do they actually have, does the core have the funds? And when I talked with Tom, he said that they've been working on this for like 10 years. So I think they're at the point where there must be some funding if they're moving forward with pre-construction phase. And you That's know. cool. Yeah. And do we, is the city of San Clemente responsible for letting those contracts like for biological monitoring and for, for beach monitoring, or is that the core that's letting those? Cause I don't remember anything coming in front of us about contracting for it. Yeah. I don't think it's city staff or contractors that are doing it. I'm, I'm figuring it's army Corps of engineers. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's an encouraging update for yeah. sure. 
And when I talked with somebody in um, Mike Levin's office today, they said that he was down, um, and I know this to be true because Tom mentioned this in his comments with the city council a couple of weeks ago, that he had done a tour with Congressman Levin and his aide, um, and I think with the acting city manager as well, of the Army Corps of Engineering project, and that Congressman Levin was very supportive. So that's a good sign too. Go Tom. Thank you, Cynthia. Any other questions for Cynthia on this? All righty. Good heavens. We get to move on to the next agenda item. Well, Chris, you're welcome to go along with us or you're welcome to depart and enjoy the rest of your evening. We thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you, you share, share phone numbers with uh, Joreen so you and she can keep in contact and she can communicate with us. I will definitely do that. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And anytime you want to come see us again, let Cynthia know or Jareen know. Will do. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. All righty. Thank you. Okie dokie. Let us move on to approval of minutes for November 12th. So, Chair Ambrose, can I jump in here? Of course. When I reviewed the recording from the December meeting, there was discussion about having me go back and change the November meeting minutes, but I did not do that. So what you are seeing uh, in this agenda packet is the exact same um, draft meeting minutes that you saw in December. Yes. And, okay, so I wanted you to uh, be aware of that. It was just decided, I think, instead of doing partial change to the minutes, that it'd be better if we just did it all over again. And I have some of your comments that you had, unless you want to repeat them. So however you want to work that out. Okay. I just want to make you aware of that. Uh, thank you for making that notation. I myself noticed that right away um, that the changes hadn't been made. I only had two comments. One was on reports um, and CAC reports on, on eight. And we're talking about November right now. So it's eight. A, I commented that instead of saying Chair Ambrose shared the following handouts, I actually reported on the handouts on each of those items. And in our December minutes, Cynthia, you used some good language, which was very similar to what I suggested to you, but we might as well be consistent. So I'm going to read to you, see if this is what you have. Uh, Chair Ambrose provided highlights from the following coastal and environmental related items and provided links for additional information. Um, I put as well as handouts because I, and my, this is what you and I have a, a stir about on occasion. I like people to see the whole thing rather than just the link. So in November, I, we provided both. If you recall, you we went through the trouble of making all those copies. Yeah, this is the notes that I have on the minutes for that section for the reports. Chair Ambrose reported highlights of the following coastal and environmental related items, supplying handouts for the agenda packet and web links to each for additional information. Well, that's exactly what I had for November in my own handwriting, but I thought you might want to be consistent. That's fine. Let's just leave what you have then. Okay. That's, and then I think the other one was on a page before, uh, which I don't know that I comment that, oh, somebody caught on, on uh, old business, page two, 5A, I'm sorry, 6A, item three, unanimously confirmed San Clemente Beautiful as a project name. That was not unanimous. It was uh, Gary, Gary dissent, Gary did not approve that one. Everybody else did. So I'm not sure how many people were at the meeting at the time. Oh, here we are. One, two, three, four. So that vote was a three to one, Cynthia. On six, A, three. Um, but I, I think that everybody um, approved it at the meeting. Now we corrected it at our last meeting. Um, somebody noted that and said, 
and Gary, Gary but agreed. There was <laughs> unanimous straw votes. I think that after discussion, Gary may have agreed with that, and I don't know. No, yeah. I don't think you did. Gary, did you change your mind? What What was the subject? Uh, the name of the project, San Clemente Beautiful. Oh, I don't care how you report it. It doesn't matter to me. I'll agree to it, but I did disagree originally. Yes, so you, you can't change this vote now, Cynthia. It was three to one. I wanted All of them, Eileen had said it was 4-0, and then she, she re remembered that that one with Gary was a 3-1 at our last meeting. But I like to keep San Clemente beautiful. Okay, so tell me how you want to change the minutes, Susan. I just want the 6A3 um, to indicate, well, here. So it's be, it would be in the second little paragraph, Cynthia where you said Supervisor Mallet distributed an updated draft document entitled Annual Work Plan FY 2020-21, noted the city council had unanimously approved the, oh, that's not the one. It's the it's third paragraph, I'm sorry. Committee members reviewed the projects, provided input and confirmed action plan items for implementation of each product with unanimous straw votes. So you, would, you could say unanimous straw votes for items one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How about except for item three? Thank you. Yes, much more efficient. And the other comment, but I did not make it then, but looking at this now, on the minutes on roll call, which is page one, you have vacant at-large community member. We don't have an at-large community member on Coastal Advisory Committee. All of you are at-large community members and you have one vacancy. Oh, well, I thought- John uh, McWigan resigned. All of you are at-large. You're not assigned a, you know, a particular area of the city, like some other city councils in other cities. Districts, they have districts. You guys are all at large. Okay, so until June when that, that number is going to go down, so that will not be there any longer. You're still all going to be at large. You're not going to we'll be. still all be at large, but we won't have one missing. Thank you for clarifying that. And then in the staff present, you have asterisks under Cynthia, David, Eileen, and then participated in meeting via teleconference. But all of us participated in the teleconferencing. You've only asterisk city staff. I think that should be, it's either all of us were, all of us participated in the meeting via teleconference, not just you three. So I'm suggesting you remove the asterisks from your name and just put a note. Um, the meeting was done via teleconference. Well, the I guess the planning commission um, has their minutes formatted in this way. So, um, well, that, it doesn't matter. We're not the planning commission or the Coastal Advisory Committee. And it doesn't matter because those three, you three staff persons are just three. We all participated in the teleconference is the point. Okay. So my motion, my, I'm asking you to correct and remove your asterisks and because it says up on top, the meeting was offered uh, teleconference only due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it already says it was teleconferenced. Okay. Okay. That's been notated. Okay. So Inez, so right now you've removed the asterisks from everybody, right? Yes. Okay. All righty. And that was all I had for November. Did anybody else have anything for November? No, I hear no voices. Let us move on to the December minutes. Oh, let's, I need a motion to approve the minutes, please, for November. Move to approve. Second. Approved. Motion by Gary and seconded by Jereen, please. Thank you. Let's move to December minutes. You need to take a vote. Oh, thank you very much for that reminder. Uh, Jereen. Aye. 
Charlie? I'll need to abstain from that one. I wasn't in attendance. Thank you, Chris. Abstain. Uh, myself, I, Gary? I. Uh, is Joe with us? I. Thank you. You good with that, Cynthia? Yes. Two abstains, the rest I. Alrighty, let's move on to December, please. Any comments from committee members on December minutes? Uh, well, I still have the same thing on the asterisks on roll call. Okay, noted. Okay. Uh, there was one other thing in here. Did everybody have a chance to read the minutes for December? Well, if no comments and I need a member, I need uh, a motion, please. Move to approve. Second. Who seconded that? Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. So a motion by Gary, second by Charlie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Abstain. Who, who abstained? Thank you, Chris Kaczynski. Did you get that, Cynthia? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. I need one of those rubber fingers. All righty. Public input. Cynthia, do you have any readings from any members of the public? Uh, let me double check uh, email. Um, no, I do not have any public comment. Okay. Then I'm not I, will, it. I will close public input. Move on to old business, the Coastal Advisory 2021 Work Plan Action Steps. That's going to be item 6A in your packet. These are the action steps that we came up with in, well, through our work since September. And we asked Cynthia to bring this back that included the items that she had last month and put them together with the ones that we compiled and she compiled for us that we did in November. She has done so. Is that correct? Everything's on this now, Cynthia? Yes, I went back and listened to the November meeting minutes and made sure that everything that was changed um, or noted was reflected in this version. And you can see I have the date of January 14th, 2021 down in the footer there. Just I noted that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we took a lot, of, a lot of time, almost an hour and 45 minutes last month to, to go through this. And, uh, and I'm happy to see that this came back in this um, format. It's easy to read. One thing I did notice is we did not prioritize any of our steps. Does anybody, is everybody still okay with that? If you look through under each topic, not all of these are in a sequential order. I'm fine right now with how it is. I'm Anybody okay. else have a question or an objection to that? I'm okay with how, how it is. I do okay. have one, one thing to add in and that's actually based on our discussion tonight. And if we are gonna be directing committee resources towards beach nourishment, which is not part of our action plan, do we need to adjust it or is there an opportunity to adjust it to add that that in? Where would you put it? Where would you enter it? I mean, it would have to be its own separate topic, right? We have to go back to the city council to add anything. Okay. I guess we could see how they react to our motion, but if they do support it, and we will have to change our action plan. Okay, well put. Cynthia, would you make a note of that, please? Yeah, and, and I think that if you 
if there is a presentation, you no, know, obviously you're going to have a recommendation to the city council to participate in the coalition or consider participating that maybe at that time, if you do present that you'd ask that you add this item to your work plan at that point in time and see. Okay, I think so that. too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I do want to bring up, I tried to listen to that recording because I know that Jereen had recommended a title for this document. Sorry, it went, I went dark again. And I have Coastal Advisory Committee 2020-21 Work Plan Action Steps. And I just want to make sure that you folks all agree upon the title of that document. And I, I tried to listen again, Jereen, and I could not find your recommendation on that title. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's reflective. I thought it was implementation. But implementation steps instead of action steps. I mean, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable with action. But we started this as an implementation plan, remember? Right. When we, when we crossed over from doing our work plan, Cynthia, I believe you introduced that now is going to be our implementation component. Yeah, it's just tricky if you've got annual work plan implementation plan. So that's where I started thinking, ah, oh, there's two word plan words in there that just didn't seem to flow. But then I, through the discussion that in November, December, there was talk of action steps. So that's kind of what I had at the top. So well, it's I'm fine obviously up to the cap alone. how you want to move forward. I'm fine with leaving it alone. And I think Jereen said she was. Anybody else have a comment or an objection to leaving it as it is? No, then Cynthia, you, your question has been answered. It'll be left as it is. Okay. But I have a question also. I've been doing a lot of work bringing to you. Um, and I, I was thinking it might go under the local, pro, local coastal program implementation plan, but it won't because that is so specific to the implementation plan. All the work that I've been brought, bringing to you on coastal resiliency, climate change, um, all of the kinds of uh, strategic plans that are caused not only by the order from the governor, but all of these, these things have a nexus about uh, coastal uh, care and conservation and preservation and all these things. And I do put a lot of hours in and I do uh, watch and, and tune into the, all of these meetings from Ocean Protection Council to uh, the California Coastal Commission, et cetera. I don't know if we should add this as a, an activity that we do because we're profiting by learning from these things, just as evidence tonight about the grant set possibilities that I was going to talk about tonight fit right into what uh, Chris was sharing. So is it, again, but it's something that's not on our, we don't even have a category for it. I looked at this before our meeting tonight. Is it something we may wanna consider for the future uh, in the taking to the city council to add on. We have in our mission and goals, you know, the need to communicate and work with other agencies and associations and things of that nature. So it would fit into that category. I don't know that we need to need to note it. It could be regarded as a regular activity we do. Correct, because we do a lot of regular activities that are not on our action steps. So that's my comment. Any comment, any, does anybody want to make a comment about what I'm just saying? Dave, are you still with us? No, he's not. Cynthia? Well, the, the local coastal program implementation plan is an actual document. Right, that's what and, I said. And so we're just waiting for direction from um, Cecilia on how to move forward um, well, we're, we're waiting for the city council to tell Cecilia how to move forward. So, well, yeah, it, it does say that community development director, city planner, and city council. So, what is it you were wanting to add? Were you wanting to add something under here? Or, uh, well, that's my whole point was I'm discussing the fact that I spend a lot of time bringing information to all of us about coastal resiliency, coastal conservation, coastal preservation, all these projects in, in sand replenishment in the certain ways falls into that. 
but that's our project is a separate project. But it should be noted that we're doing this work. However, as I say that, I'm acknowledging that a lot of us do a lot of work that are coastal and environmentally related that do not have a special succinct category. It would fall under our goals and missions that we keep in contact with other organizations on a, on a local regional level, so to speak, even state about items of mutual interest in coastal environmental services. So I guess I've explained and answered my own question. <laughs> it's what we do. It, it can be conceived and, and or, or seen as something we should be doing anyway. Correct? Anybody agree with that? No comment? That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. All righty, I'm moving on. Uh, are there any other comments then on the work plan action steps? Then Cynthia is looking for a motion to approve. Is that correct, Cynthia? Uh, yeah. It, 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 I, I move to approve. Could you make a full motion, please? I move to approve the coast. I remove, uh, make a motion to approve the work plan app action steps document to achieve the goals of the fiscal year 2020-21 CAC annual work plan. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Joe, okay. did we get you? I'm sorry, was that Charlie who seconded? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I am an aye, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All righty, great. Hooray, moving on to the next item. And Cynthia, again, I'm calling on you. Environmental Sustainability Grant Applications. Okay, you'll see in the memo there. Um, hopefully you've had um, time to read it. We, uh, each year, environmental programs in water conservation, we have $12,000 in funding to provide uh, funding to nonprofit organizations and San Clemente Public Schools for um, projects um, um, that directly benefit the city's residents. And in there, you can see we have $6,000 from the Clean Ocean Fund, $4,000 from the Water Conservation Fund, and $2,000 from the Solid Waste and Recycling Fund. Now, this is our second cycle. Um, we did not receive any grants in the first cycle, which those are usually due in June, which rolls into the beginning of the fiscal year. So we had three applications. We received three applications for the second round. Um, requesting a total of $5,450. So obviously there's plenty of money remaining uh, since we had $12,000. So uh, you'll see um, the three organizations, Casa Romanica, they've commissioned an immersive art installation to educate our community about the importance of pollinators and recycling. And you'll see this on table one, second page of that uh, memo. The Ocean Institute um, has an adopt a class initiative that supports ocean based programming. Uh, they have trans trans um, they've revised it to be virtual learning, uh, since obviously we know that we can't they can't be doing tours in person, etc. They do have pre and post surveys uh, that will be used to assess the knowledge of careers and education pathways in STEM and attitudes toward the environment. And then the San Clemente Sunrise Rotary Club wants to expand beach cleanup efforts to include high school student branch interact club who are mentored by the Rotarians. And in the table, you'll see the funding account recommendations, how much money we, the Environmental uh, Grants Committee, which is me, Dana McIntosh, who is, uh, manages the solid waste and recycling program, and Nikki Beach, who is our water conservation analyst, we sit, we look at it and we, depending on the type of project it is, we kind of determine which fund fits more appropriate with what they're proposing to do. So here's the various funding account recommendations that the Environmental Grant Committee is recommending. So we're just looking for a recommendation 
from the Coastal Advisory Committee, which would be a recommendation to the city manager to fund the three organizations as detailed in the table. Well, and, I, I, and I believe the detail, the actual grant applications were provided in the packet for you. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. I noted that. I really thought, if I may just share my opinion first here, that these are three excellent projects to fund. I did get a call from the Ocean Institute and they were saying, you know, do you still have the grant program? And I said, well, can you, you know, the programs that I would really like to see invested in are the real hands-on programs for kids. And she said, well, we're not doing those. And I said, how about virtual? And she said, you know, we're just starting that. And I said, I think that'd be a great idea because you don't want to leave these out. You don't want to leave kids out of having ocean experiences if you can show them virtually and the, the you know, the dioramas and, and even the videos and things of that nature. Well, they were very excited about it. I'm so glad they, they uh, applied because I wasn't sure that they were going to. But I like these other two as well. I like the mentoring concept with from the Rotary Club and beach cleanups and responsibility and keeping our beaches clean and having people be accountable for what they're doing. And I also like the Casa Ramonica because it opens another venue for people who haven't been there to get instruction, and particularly with the pollinators. That's great. That's my two cents worth. Anybody else who would like to comment? Is the Casa Romante, is it free to get in there? Like, can, can anybody from the public just walk in there or is there a fee to get into the facility? And sometimes there's a there's a fee and yeah. sometimes not. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific of that. It depends, uh, it depends on the, the event, Joe. Okay. It depends on the event. Yes, it does. And whether it's a fundraiser as well. But usually the things for kids might have a small fee if there's materials involved. But Cynthia, you had a comment? Yeah, I think they charge. For the most part, it's a fee to get in there. But I want to say $5, but I might be wrong on that. But it's still, I think there is a fee to get in there. Okay. That was that was a question. I mean, so I think it's a good project too, but presumably somebody's got to pay to get in to see the, whatever, the exhibit that they're doing, right? Well, I don't, I hope that that's not the case. Did they say in their application that there's a fee to get in, Cynthia? Uh, no, they didn't say that specifically, but typically it is. But I'm just going to add that, I mean, not during COVID times, but during non-COVID times that schools do go there routinely, especially yeah. so many schools on field trips. So when those start up again, then kids going through there will be exposed to that exhibit. Yeah, no, I, I, th I, think, it, I think it's good. I, I was just personally curious. Yes. And I think they're proposing um, some of this artwork inside as well as outside. So yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they can change up their protocols to allow some groups to come as long as you're outside all the time and practicing social distancing with COVID um, and just avoid inside. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sure that they will be following the policies. Yeah. They have a very strong board that would ensure that would be happening for COVID. All righty, looking for a motion to approve this grant funding. Do I have somebody who would like to make a motion, please? I'll make the motion to approve the three grants as recommended. Do we, do we need to name them? Or? Yes. Well, if you look on the agenda, there's a staff recommendation if you want to read that underneath. Um, if you want it to be that recommendation. Okay, wait. Sorry. Well, I think it should be specific because the city council is not going to know what's detailed in table in the table. It's city manager. Oh, okay, so I, my motion either way. is that the city manager approves to fund the three organizations as detailed in table one of the San Clemente CAC meeting packet. No, actually, I'm going to ask you to, to yeah. spell those organizations out. Okay, so I'm going to change my motion to recommend to the city manager approval to fund three organizations. One, Casa Romantica in the amount of $2,000. Two, Ocean Institute in the amount of $2,000. And three, San Clemente Sunrise Rotary Club in the amount of $1,450. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Who did that? I did. Or, or, or whoever. You Okay, Gary, go ahead. 
Gary second. Motion by Jermaine. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, since you've got your numbers. Thank you very much. All righty, let me go on to the next item, please, which is uh, bacterial monitoring, I mean, monitoring report and environmental programs updates. Cynthia, is there something specific you'd like to point out to us? Um, I do want to point out that we have a bacteria total maximum daily load or called a TMDL. And we are supposed to meeting water, supposed to be meeting water quality objectives by April 4th, 2021. And there are two sites, three sites in San Clemente that are not currently going to meet those requirements. That is Pochi Beach, North Beach, which had some exceedances in the last year, unfortunately, and then the pier. So we are communicating with the Regional Water Quality Control Board and there's something called a time schedule order that kind of ex basically extends the deadline for the bacteria TMDL. We are hoping that the Regional Board would actually um, revise the bacteria TMDL and they said they would but then they ran out of time. So we might have to go um, with this time schedule order, which would then require us to develop a plan on how we're going to meet um, the bacteria objectives in the next four or five years, which I think is doable. I, I mean, we know the pier is doing well. And it, um, did the pier have any exceedances during December? Um, uh, no. So the pier has been doing very well especially uh, since the uh, bird netting has been installed. Um, there's been very few exceedances. Um, Pochi is gonna be our challenge. We're looking to do a diversion over there and you can see that that site has exceeded Pochi Creek Zero and that, that, that continues. Uh, North Beach, this in December did not have any exceedances, but we've been keeping an eye on North Beach, um, trying to get people out there to observe what's going on and trying to identify why there's exceedances down at North Beach on occasion. It's not a lot, but the bacteria TMDL basically says they don't want to have one exceedance of bacteria during dry weather, which, you know, really, that's pretty challenging, <laughs> especially at the outlets of these large watersheds, Prima de Sheka, Saguna de Sheka. Um, it, it's, it's tough to try and find the sources. So where, where's the outlet? Because we haven't talked a lot about North Beach on our committee. Where's the outlet for that? That is just north of the North Beach um, shack. And you can only really see it when you're standing uh, if from, from the west looking. I'm sorry, from the east looking west. You can only really see it when you're standing on the um, train platform. Oh. So if you wanted to go to the actual outlet, you would uh, go down to North Beach and start walking north. Okay. Yep. And okay. then and then you could see it. And in fact, sometimes you can't even get around to see it because there's a head wall there, you know, because it's all underground right there. But we do have diversions. Uh, we do have a diversion in the MO2 um, in the Saguna de Sheka, right kind of near our water reclamation plant. We also have another diversion that diverts the water back to the water reclamation plant that comes from the sub watershed that kind of travels along the closer to the beach, closer to the coast. I can, I can probably share maps with you if you'd like. Um, so we're just trying to want, we're, we're trying to figure out why we're having exceedances because we have the diversions. What's going on at that um, outlet right there. And there's sometimes rock we do find Mm, encampment materials like you know is somebody sleeping there you know homeless activity uh, on occasion and then of course there's birds down there too and we're not doing any avian dna analysis at north beach but might be something for us to con consider so what about at pochi what progress has been made when david mentioned a, a study or some action was going to be happening at pochi so there is an investigative 
sampling to try and figure out the sources of the bacteria coming down from the watershed. So it's called an area of investigation and the county and the city are collaborating together. And we've moved upstream into the watershed to take samples, to try and samples from the actual outfalls that fall into the main stem to try and like process of, el of elimination using the HF-183 marker, which is the human marker. The challenge with using the human marker is that there's recycled water used heavily within that watershed. And so we knew that the HF-183 marker was going to show up, um, but some of the tributaries entering into uh, Prima de Sheka Creek um, don't have HF-183, so we can kind of eliminate those and we don't have to go upstream and try and find sources. So they did, they started some analysis in September, October. I think they're planning on another meeting in um, uh, February for to get an update. So I don't have any more information on that though. But they're, when they get to a point where they want to present, I, they'll come to the Coastal Advisory Committee and present some findings. Okay, I just want to stay on top of that, particularly yep. with the readings. We're not, we don't have the falconer down there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pochi Clean Beach project, the UV facility had really good efficiency. They they changed some, they did some upgrades to it. And so last year there was some really um, uh, good quality water coming out, but we still have exceedances down in the shoreline. Uh, we did have um, an observation at one point in time where there were 200 seagulls out in the water, in the shoreline water, um, not necessarily in the pond. I think that was part of the problem that Pochi before was the seagulls would come to the pond and drink water. But still, when you have 200 seagulls out in the water, you know, there's a good chance that their fecal matter could be causing um, some of the exceedances as well. So, yeah, because the, the testing is 100 feet out. Is that correct? No, or is that the shoreline now. Oh, it used to be. No. What am I thinking? It's of? always ankle deep, ankle okay. to knee deep. Yeah. Hmm. Like where people sure. would wade. You know what I mean? So, yes, 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 yes. Right. In fact, in my mind's eye now, being down at Pochi, I, I remember directly that little white pipe over there on the right side. Yeah, and that's the discharge pipe from the Pochi Clean Beach Project, the UV facility. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cynthia, on the, uh, on the report, uh, is there... What, what's what's sort of the, the simple summary on how to, how to read this? Um, and I'm sorry, I did, I, it's rotated. I, I, I'm sorry, it's really small. I can send it to you separately, but- um, I, can actually, I can actually see it fine. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's three indicator bacteria, enterococcus, fecal coliform, and total coliform. And on, the, on page two, you'll see what the single sample standard limits are. So when, so a single sample standard is they'll take a sample and that sample, the enterococci cannot exceed 104 coliform forming units. So those, that, that's the little bacteria dots that are forming in the Petri dish. Someone has to count all those. Um, fecal is 400 and total coliform is 10,000. So, You'll see um, if any of these values exceed those uh, single sample standard water quality objectives, it'll be in red. You'll see that it's in red. So for example, Pocha Creek Zero, I think that was the only site that exceeded this, um, this month on December 15th and December 17th. Got it, and that was on uh, intercaucus and fecal, right? Uh, yes, correct. And I think there was the high tide event. What does it say? So that was during high tide events too. So we know that the high tides can contribute because the high tides can come in and, and cause that berm to breach. It can overtop the berm. Um, and then it starts drawing the pond water out. And the pond water we think is, you know, ju it just sits there and stagnates. Yeah, that's that's the water that's underneath the bridge, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. That forms under there. Now the UV plant draws it out and then discharges it. But also the UV plant, when there's a high tide event, it does not operate because it, um, it would draw in salt water, which would be detrimental to the um, equipment, to the Pochi Clean Beach Project equipment. So during, 
So at least once a month, that UV project is turned off because it cannot draw in that salt water. Uh, and, and zero and zero. Just to clarify, zero is at the uh, at the mouth of the, the 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 water that's dumping into the ocean, right? Yes. Now, if the water is not discharging to the ocean, they just the sampler will just kind of look upstream at the creek and kind of determine where that water would discharge if it was able to and take the sample at point zero. But basically it's straight up looking up the, the channel. It's, it's it's basically in front of the shore cliffs, uh, the, the, uh, the beach house. No. No? Point zero is right in front of the channel. Okay, okay. So, I, okay, I was, I, get, I was giving you 50 meters, but okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, so, and then, um, they do sample up and up coast and down coast, 100 feet, 75 feet, 75 feet. Even then, still you're probably not in front of the beach club if you go okay. south. Yeah. Yeah. So. Got it. It's, it's it's all it's all really close to the the, the channel. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, we have discussed and, and and we're looking at this as doing a diversion upstream of the high tide line. So that we can capture all of the water, even all of the creek runoff for water, even during high tide events. Uh, so that we can capture that and divert it and send it to um, the land outfall. So there's discussion about doing that. That's about a two to two and a half million dollar project. Uh, how high would that be? What do you mean? How far? You said up, up the... Upstream? Up yes. It would, we want to make sure we capture Cascadita Creek, which comes in underground. It, it, the diversion would be underground. You, you have to walk into the channel. It's That's by the DMV, correct? Well, Cascadita is the creek that travels by the DMV. And then when it enters the main channel of Prima de Sheka, which is basically a little bit up from the gas station. Okay. You know, there's the gas station, and there's a couple businesses up from okay. there. Yeah. That's underneath the channel. That's where Cascadita Creek comes in. Okay. So. Yeah. Mm. Charlie. I was going to say is, is one other. Maybe maybe I'm just off topic here, but I just I was just curious. Uh, I noticed when I was playing volleyball at the beach at uh, Doheny the other day that they had posted on there that uh, swim at your own risk. That bacteria levels are high. Um, <clears throat> do we do that? Uh, do we put those signs down by like Pochi and um, that's question number one. Question number two is, do you know, do you know how Doheny is assessing or are they using the same criteria that we're using as far as uh, the measurement tools before they post? Yeah, so Pochi Beach is a county beach. So our city staff do not go and post the advisories. Got there it. is a there's an advisory sign always at Pochi Beach. We really advise people not to swim. If the creek is outletting, we don't want, you should not be swimming in that water. Yeah. Now, if the advisory, if these exceedances, hold on, let me, let me turn on this light again, sorry. If the advisories, um, there's a geo mean, that single sample, single sample standard right there on page two is one thing, but if there is, um, multiple exceedances on multiple sampling events they will expand they will expand the length of that advisory and that's when the county county will go out and post the advisory signs at a longer length like sometimes there has been signs in front of um, the shoreline beach club house there uh, and answer to your second question the sampling methods and the amounts are EPA set. They're set by EPA. So they're all done the exact same way. So the, sta the standard that they would have with Doheny would be the same standard that we would have here in our document. That's correct. Throughout the whole United States for, okay. for shorelines. For, That's good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions on bacteria reports? No, but for the city beaches, the lifeguards, they, they put up the flags, right? So like the county would tell them that there was exceedance and then the life, the city sent how many lifeguards go out and post. Correct. So the pier at the pier, it'll be the lifeguards. They were kind of, we had so many exceedances at the pier that they were trying to tell, they were kind of calling me to say, hey, we have to keep building these signs. 
<laughs> and people would take them off, take them down oh. off the beach, which they're not supposed to. And so they're like, can you come help build some signs? And I said, how about if I put some netting up? <laughs> and so that's worked. <laughs> that's where it went. All righty. We ready to move along to the next. Thank you, Cynthia. You're welcome. Uh, um, the uh, environmental programs. I have one question on the recycling and solid waste, the abandoned bulky item requests. I've asked this question from you before because when we do the um, San Clemente Beautiful, I wanna know where the things are being dropped off and, and I know you're saying they're all bulky, but are they, these 79 items, were they based all around the city? Like from people moving or apartment complexes or are there certain areas and specifically? Yeah, they're not just 79 items. It could be a whole house that somebody has dumped on, you know, in a spot. And there are some usual suspected areas, Campana Canasta, which is up uh, near Trader Joe's, kind of over, there's an apartment complex there. It's usually near multifamily complexes. Okay. Um, and where somebody's moving out and... They don't want to try and organize a, you know, to get CRNR to pick up their bulky items and they just dump it on the side of the street on the sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have a question regarding uh, clean ocean programs? I think because of the holidays, there's pretty much scant activity, especially with COVID. Right. All righty. That said, let me go on to the next item here which is reports and well my two reports for CAC members um, the California Coastal Commission uh, management programs the section 309 and we went over with Chris when he was here and also the shoreline erosion control and public beach restoration program and grant we went over that the other the last one I have is the get inspired newsletter on ocean stewardship uh, from Nancy Caruso, and you, you all, uh, or those of you who had been with us have known Nancy Caruso as a kelp lady. She was the one who rebuilt and reforested the kelp forest in Laguna Beach, um, I think a decade or two ago, and is very active in the state for all kinds of programs, uh, saving kelp and fish and all kinds of things. She's a micro, uh, she's a marine biologist by trade, but she I don't know if did any of you have the chance to, I hope you took the opportunity to look at this newsletter, which was one of the links that I asked Cynthia to provide, I actually asked her to provide the newsletter. And I think in one of those things that she sent out from me, the newsletter was actually, if you scroll down, you'd run into this newsletter. It was very colorful, but it's something that I thought would be something we might want to entertain. I wrote a note uh, originally saying to Cynthia, maybe to Dave and Cynthia, maybe they want to consider doing something like this in environmental services and coastal advisory could have a little plug because it says, you know, what we've accomplished since March, 2020, the restoration activities, 12 abalone surveys with 25 volunteers, and it goes all the way down um, to activities, environmental policy work, uh, started working with assembly, Cadi Petri Norris, who's very active in environmental legislation, um, to add the word restoration to the Marine Life Management Act, um, began the campaign to manage and control a certain invasive species. And uh, all of these kinds of things, public education, all the kinds of things that were done in publication, and then promotional and public relations uh, were listed. And then ways you can help, opportunities to volunteer. I just thought this was a great little newsletter and it was brochure-like that would be very effective in our city and maybe something like this for clean ocean fee could be done. These kinds of categories that are very, you know, look-see, doesn't have to blast you, you don't have to read volumes. And I don't know if she does these monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly, but something fodder for us to think about when we're talking about clean ocean fee and the campaign to educate our public in our community. Something to think about, if you haven't looked at it, please uh, go into the link section or the stuff that I asked Cynthia to send to you to, to look, uh, to read those kinds of things. 
Anyway, because there's things that people might not know about, just even in our city, when we talk about clean oceans, a lot of people don't understand that, for example, a parking lot at uh, Casa Romanica might be covered by clean ocean fees because of the way the parking lot was built and because of the runoff that's in, in the parking lot that's caused it to crack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that go on that you don't think about when you think about clean water. All right, my point is made with that. And Cynthia, we're going on to you, 9B city staff, the Clean Ocean Fee Renewal Update. There we go, I was just talking about that. Yeah, Clean Ocean Fee Renewal Update. So the fee analysis consultant is now looking at our utility billing system and uh, comparing um, information from, from previous renewals to see if there's any parcels that are missing that we need to make sure are accurate and correct. So one, they can determine what the revenue is and then extrapolate what Dave and I are proposing as the cost over the next five years so they can come up with an actual fee for each uh, dwelling unit, residential, commercial, and multifamily. So, um, we're waiting on that fee. That should that amount should um, probably be in about a month um, that I can come back to the Coastal Advisory Committee and present that to you. My, my it won't be the March. Are we in January, February? It might be the March meeting is what I'm thinking. Okay. Well, the sooner the better. If if the goal is still to get the uh, clean ocean fee active again this this summer, I thought that was the goal of the City Council. Oh, uh, we have not presented it to the city council. We would come before CAC with the amount and then see what you would recommend to the, if you'd recommend that to the city council and then go before city council and get their direction on how to move forward. I think when it was discovered in the budget plan, uh, that was a question to the city manager, the acting city manager at that time. And I believe that the summertime was the preferred choice of getting this going, the Clean Ocean Act. So... Yeah, I think we're waiting for new city council members to get seated as well. So we have to wait till that fee analysis gets completed and then we'll go before city council. Uh, well, I know I'm just repeating what, what I listened to the city council say at a finance meeting. Oh, when was that? Whenever they had the finance meeting, it was uh, probably at the, towards the end of the year. Oh, okay. Right. 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cynthia, uh, the pure bacteria source characterization study update. I thought you were going to have a meeting or send out a, a progress report to your members. Yeah, we have not. We're, we've drafted that um, um, memo or update for the pure bacteria source characterization study. We should be able to get that out next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just the status, but really the status on it is uh, we have uh, started doing some more observations and we're still kind of observing CRNR trucks just to see if they're leaking. We are also trying to work with fishermen's to reduce the amount of liquid waste that they have in their trash. So then that liquid waste doesn't get transferred into the trucks that then sometimes leak. But now with COVID again, I mean, the restaurant's pretty much shut down again. So, um, but I, um, so I don't know when they're going to really start monitoring again. It might not be till the end of this month or early next month, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to give you an update on that. Just with the new lockdown orders again, the activity oh. down there's a little different. Well, I just think, especially the members, it would be helpful because I listened to BPNR the other night, I think it was Tuesday. Um, and I know John Jory was asked what the latest was with this committee and he said he hadn't heard anything and I knew that you were planning to do this memo. So that's why I brought this up. Okay, yeah, we'll make sure to get it out. I okay. did have dinner at the Fisherman's the other night, just so you know. Oh, okay. Thank you, did you, did you sit down in the restaurant? No, they they what they're what they're doing is is it's basically takeout, but they allow right. you to eat on the pier. On the tables on the pier. Yep. And that's where that complaint goes back to Jareen is that I think that it's probably all throw takeaway throw you know 
obviously not reusable plates and they're probably filling up the trash cans that are sitting out there yeah. by those tables. Mm -hmm. And just so the committee knows, um, I there was a group of surfers that had contacted me saying that because of the amount of disposable containers and people taking out their food to go, the trash cans get overflowed pretty easily and they're open trash cans. And I think the wind just blows all the material and it ends up right there where they're surfing. So a lot of trash is getting into the ocean. So. Well, and, that, and, and the fishermen's is super sh short staff. So I'm sure they're not changing those trash, those trash bags very often. Yeah, and we, we did convey today, an email was sent to the manager to oh, good. better monitor and empty those trash cans more often. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, items from staff, pu potential future agenda items. Um, so don't have a whole lot, I guess, for February, the annual work plan implementation update. Um, we can talk about any of that, give you a status on the clean ocean fee renewal update. Oh, uh, where am I here? Oh, what did I write? Oh, I wrote Tom Bonnegat. Oh, wait, before we go there, oh, I can ask, uh, let me see. I don't want to, I don't want to miss this opportunity. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Cynthia, please continue. I'm going to wait till after you're done. Okay, there's future meetings, but the railroad impact study and um, Ocean Protection Council strategic plan, I, I think those were brought on by a couple of the CAC members. Habitat restoration project, I think that was a um, Orange County Coast Keeper project, possibly. Oh, but that was, and I don't, I don't have any info on those. Yeah, they're still advertising that, but when I when I talked to somebody, they said they weren't doing it any, anymore. I don't know if it has to, I have no idea why not. So we can check with Heal the Bay and see what they're doing. Yeah, I think it's Orange County Coast Keeper. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of Heal the Bay because they spoke about doing this uh, yesterday when I was listening to the California Coastal Commission on the grant stuff. Okay. Um. Did we make any headway on the bottle refill stations and when are we revisiting that? Thank I did not make any headway in the last couple of weeks, um, but I plan to ask some questions of maintenance. I apologize, just. Can we put that on our February agenda then, please? Cynthia, can we put Maybe, that on our February? I mean, if, yeah, if the other CAC members are okay with that, it's up to the other CAC members. Two. All in agreement to put the update on the bike refill station research that we need in order to proceed. Uh, I'm going to do a strong vote, Jareen. Yes, Joe. I mean, does this? Do we think we can have the research by February? Is that yeah. a real? Okay, then yes, then yes, absolutely. Charlie. Chris. Gary. I. And I'm an I. So unanimously, we're asking you. Thank you so much. You got it. Yep. Okay. And I did get a, I had a contact with Mickey from Pure Pride. And I, she asked me to give her a call about funding and how they got the funding. And it was interesting. She said they got the funding from various people. But I said, but in the paper, it said only there was one donor. And she said, she couldn't go into it at the time, but she said the money then was all donated to the city for the city to disperse. I thought that was very interesting. Did you know that, Cynthia? No, what did you, what, what was that? That the money, money that was, the fundraising that was done by Pure Pride for the water refill station uh, was donated to the city for the city's distribution. Something to look into, maybe you can inquire. I'm confused for the city's distribution. Oh. Or probably pure pride um, kinds of things, projects. 
I, I think she's. I think she's suggesting oh, pure yeah. pride cut. Pure pride cut a check to city and city staff installed the water thing. Oh, okay. Or yeah. contracted for the installation. Somehow right. the city must have had yeah. it. So Thank it you. seems Thank as though the funding was transferred to the city to execute the project. And that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's exactly what it was, but she didn't spell it out. But Joe, I think you hit the nail on the head. Thank you very much. All righty. Um, let's go on to comments from committee members. And Charlie, if you wouldn't mind, you have the latest news on electric bikes being used in the city. Could you kind of give us a update on what happened at your meeting Tuesday night, even though I listened in? Um, you're straight from the from the uh, BPNR yeah. commission. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, Thank you. Uh, we um, we broke up. Uh, well, the, <coughs> council had asked us to come back with um, some recommendations on um, the usage of e-bikes in parks, inland trails, <coughs> and the beach trail. Uh, with parks, uh, basically what we did was is we said that uh, if I recall, she's, I should remember it was my motion. Um, no motorized. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do you, you can't ride. Can't really ride. Uh, I think we said we can't ride. You can't ride bikes on the turf. Uh, and bikes was normal bikes, e-bikes, uh, and obviously motorized vehicles, not, nothing on the turf. So that was, that was the parks inland trails. We didn't do anything. Um, uh, the big, uh, I think the big reason for that is, is we felt that generally those trails are wide enough to be able to accommodate both pedestrians and bike riders. Um, and then further to that, we had had a joint meeting, uh, I think before the holidays, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with uh, public safety and, and base, and, you know, we had, um, we had fire and we had OCD, OCSD on there. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's a matter of them not reporting, uh, you know, people not reporting or, uh, or if it's in fact not an issue, but uh, with the inland trails uh, and, and, and truth be told for the beach trail as well, there's just been no reporting of incidents of anybody getting injured um, or anything of that, of that like with, uh, with bikes hitting pedestrians or, 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 or bicyclists even hurting themselves. Uh, in fact, the only only things that had been reported and it had been only a few cases had been bicyclists hurting themselves, whether it be on an e-bike or on a bike uh, on city streets, not on the trails. So we didn't do anything on the inland trails. On the beach trail, what we did was um, we basically said you can't ride your bike. You can't, you, and when I say bike, I mean bike and e-bike. Uh, you can't ride on the Miraposa trail, Mir Miraposa uh, bridge anymore. Um you need to, we, we set the new speed limit at five miles an hour. Um, and we are going to, um, you know, without without having sign blight, uh, gonna put on the trail that uh, that bikes need to yield to pedestrians. Um, there may, may have been one more thing that we did. Oh, I think we codified, we, we put into the, into the city ordinance, uh, it never mentioned e-bikes. We put uh, e-bikes in the city ordinance. Um, that, that's applicable to um, riding bikes uh, on trails. So that's it. Thank you very much. And there was a lot of discussion that went on at that meeting. So it was well. Yeah, it was. It, it's a it's a trick. It's a very very tricky issue with a lot of people with a lot of passion on both sides. And so we we tried to we tried our best to thread the needle with. You know, allowing people to continue to have freedom to be able to ride bikes, but then also being able to um, maybe be uh, more more courteous and conscientious of the people that are walking on the trail and and uh, and that. Um, <clears throat> I think the big key takeaway that that I that I felt was uh, how the the commission was operating off of was. Um, that, you know, it's just a few bad actors that are really causing uh, the vast majority of problems. And that, uh, you know, it, it, for the most part, like, I don't know, 90%, whatever, whatever number you want to put on it, but some, some super majority of instances, most, most people are behaving themselves and, and, are, and are pretty cur courteous and conscientious. Yes. I think three of the items that, that came up that interested me was there, there was, uh, I thought, several comments about having an educational program 
on the rules of the road of, especially with electric bikes and the rules on the trails. I think that's important for people to know. And maybe there could be some kind of certification program at the joint meeting that you had, Charlie. I think the, uh, um, the sheriff who was there uh, indicated he'd be willing to participate in that educational type program. Uh, so I thought that was a good idea. Another thing that struck me is somebody was asking about uh, licensing. Do you need a license to get an electric bike? And right now you don't, but is that something that people are thinking of? And some people are thinking about advancing that status in Sacramento. But it was, it was brought out, and I'm not sure if it was you or maybe it was Rick Ayers who said he had talked to a police officer on the streets of San Clemente because he was concerned about e-bikes on the sidewalks and also two people on an e-bike and no helmets and underage riders. Well, we have probably in all of our communities, we see all of those things, at least I do in mine. And the police said they're not enforcing any of those. So that's, yeah. that's disappointing to say the least. And, and then the last thing about accidents on or run-ins or scrapes with e-bikes on the Coastal Trail, I've, I've testified on that and been nearly run over myself uh, with a whole bunch of people, but it's several times, but uh, it's a matter of getting out of the way and hugging one of the fences, et cetera. But a lot of people have told me they don't, even though they've been run down, one, one guy got a broken leg, uh, 911 was called, et cetera, but they don't report it when they called the police, they had no substantive things to tell the police because the, the, the rider had left the scene, it was a hit and run. Uh, of course, there's nothing to identify the bike. There's nothing that's identifiable to identify the bike. And most people who aren't e-bike riders couldn't identify one from a regular bike or just a, you know, just a pedaling type bike. Uh, so a lot of people don't report them because they don't get results. They don't, they don't have enough proof to prove that they were hit by a, a electric bike. But those do happen quite frequently. I took a bike, I, I took a walk with um, a city employee uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and that person got scraped by a bike who had a surfboard on it. So when I hear people say they measure their bikes with their surfboard on, and it's not any wider than the handlebars. Well, I don't know, this surfboard nearly knocked this person over. So I heard somebody say that I didn't know. I think Bernie had mentioned that I didn't understand that it's got to be wider than the handlebars. Um, yes, yeah, I would think so too. That made no sense um, to me. But yeah, anyway. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of, uh, certainly in favor of education. I think licensing might be a bridge too far, but uh, but ni neither one seemed to gain a lot of traction, so. No, neither one did. I think that uh, your chairperson, Steve, and the rest of you decided if we make, in fact, Steve even said, if we lower the speed limit to from 10 to five, that will make a difference. And of course, people will want to speed anyway because they're used to it. But at least the community will see we're taking some steps, and we'll see how those work. And if they don't, um, if they don't produce a better results with you know lack of incidents, etc., or safety concerns, then maybe looking into education programs, etc. I would think yeah. the education yeah. programs should come out first, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> someone, someone, someone had asked us to. Uh opine on enforcement and uh and and uh steve was pretty uh, chair strager was pretty clear that he felt that that was outside of our mandate so we 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 gave our recommendation city council will do it with it what they will um and uh you know and then further to that uh the enforcement element they'll have to figure out what they want to do with that i i I personally think from the conversations that i've had and then the conversation that we had with public safety that there can be some element of enforcement down on the beach trail that would allow for people to be a little bit more aware so and charlie thank um, you for adding that Jerry, I, yes i feel like we're kind of getting a little off, off topic but i would really like to continue the conversation perhaps even a little bit offline because this is something i deal a lot with at our at our school in particular and there is actually a large appetite and we've been instructed by the principal of our school to have an education program in place for middle schoolers to take a class on the safety of e-bikes because it's gotten so out of hand. Yeah. And so I'm actually 
been tasked with that. So I would love to explore opportunities for any sort of education programs we could bring into our schools in San Clemente because they're really needed. And I think uh, school administrators really want those programs in their schools. So gosh, that would be that'd be wonderful. And I bet you we could get OCSD to do that. I um, think so too. We, just, we, we would just have to, as as with all things, we would have to spearhead and push it. So okay. I'll contact you and just send you an email, but but yeah, to have a conversation with us because we've sp spoken to the OC Bike Coalition about putting something together for our middle, middle schoolers. And um, so I would like to talk to you as yeah, well. That'd be, that'd be fabulous. Okay. And I think even including, um, Jermaine, you might want to include uh, Brenda Miller in that. She's the one who designed the bike paths and et cetera in the city and has won several awards for the city. But I'm sure she may know of other education programs that are maybe already in place. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for bringing that up. I think the education component is really critical. It should be education first to learn how to, I, I mean, I nearly got hit by a man who told me he didn't know how to stop. I just, I just think that uh, for the most part, as I said a couple of times on the me in the meeting, I, I think we've got good citizens. I, I love this town. And I think what it really boils down to more than anything is, um, yeah, sure, you're going to have some bad actors, but um, I, I think generally where, where there are problems, it's, it's, it's just lack of awareness is really what it boils down to more than anything. But that's why the education program is so important. I think in schools too, Jereen, if you had some kind of cert certificate of, a, of completing the course, that would be helpful as well. And maybe the Boy Scouts groups could get involved with this too. Yeah, That'd I mean, be I a think, good scout project. Yeah, I think it, it, it's definitely just because even the school's PE is online and there's really nothing that the PE teachers are doing. So they're actually looking for things that they could push out to the kids. So that there's an opportunity that if there's something we could do that we could partner with the PE teachers to have this be part of their curriculum. Oh, great so, idea, part yeah. of their curriculum. I think great we idea. should move on. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else have any comments? Joe? Joe, do you have anything to share? I, I don't. Did they make the commission members disclose whether they had electric bikes before they voted or not? Some of them I'm did. Just kidding. I, I don't have anything else. I, I, I didn't mean <laughs> to bring the topic back up. No, nothing else for me. I, I am not conflicted. I do not have an e-bike. Uh, anybody else from uh, from the committee have anything else to share? Cynthia, staff, anything else to share? I'd like us somebody to make the adjournment, please. And by the way, before you do that, thank you very much. I thought this was a very productive meeting. We took a little longer than I intended, but we covered a lot of great material. Thank you for all of you for your input. It's very valued. Thank you. I'll make a motion, a motion to adjourn. To well, you've got to read the whole thing, Charlie. Oh, yes, ma'am. I uh, make a motion to adjourn to the next uh, regular Coastal Advisory Committee uh, scheduled for Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. May I have a second, please? Second. Who was that? Me, Gary. Okay. Motion made by Charlie Smith, seconded by Gary McCacken. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any post? All righty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you in February. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thanks, Have a good night. Thank you. Good Thank you. night. <sighs> Thank you, Cynthia. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you. All righty. Oh, I've lost all my little viewpoints to to stop my stuff. Here we go. Leaving you now. Drive safe. Okay, oh, no, you're not going anywhere. You're already home, aren't you? No, I'm at work this time. Oh, you're at the office? Okay, drive safe. All right.